And good morning. It is a Thursday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. I'm Glenn. He's Griffin. Lots to do on today's program. You got the picture? Oh, you already have Jordan Westbrook up there, don't you? We do already have Jordan Westbrook up there. My bad. My bad, we do, because he hit the walk-off home run. It's funny because he's doing that little bit of a, you know, uh, it, um, unfair to compare him to Cedric Mullins for a year because Cedric Mullins was having a better season. But, like, he's starting to get to the point where, like, you remember everything that he's done. Despite the fact that, in Jordan Westbrook's case, he's not actually having a particularly good season so far. He's just, he's had a couple of really big moments. All right, a uh, lot to do on the program today. Coming up a little bit later on, uh, we will catch up with former Maryland safety Bo Braid, expected to go pretty early in the NFL draft. Speaking of the draft, we will uh, have our weekly draft segment. We will catch up with Press Box's Joe Serpico. Talk a little bit more about Jackson Holiday with his uncle Josh Holiday, the baseball coach at Oklahoma State. And also coming up today, make a trip to Bowie to chat with Colin Burns, who is off to a red hot start to the season. All of that coming up on the program today. Today's show is brought to you by the Green Turtle. Griffin, what's going on at the Green Turtle? Free $10 bets every uh, Thursday today and every Thursday at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks in Towson and Canton. They are offering you a free $10 bet, and you can use it on whatever you would like, and you can experience the ultimate destination for game day excitement, great food, and live in-person betting, so be sure to check out the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks today or tonight in Towson and Canton and pick up your free bets so you can make some money while enjoying some food and some, uh, there's a lot going on, baseball, golf, whatever you would like uh, tonight at the Green Turtle. I had a suggestion from someone that we should mark how many times mm, someone yes. has been man of the match mm. on Like a picture. sticker maybe? Or like uh, you mean like an Ohio State style helmet yeah, right. sticker? That's what you're thinking of? I'm not opposed to that idea. I think that you know. would work. Um, I was just gonna like make a like a, a note, dash. like a little one, two, so that type like, of. We just like put a star on the. Uh, with like a marker. I mean, we could. I mean, that's the you're, you're suggesting stars is the answer. I mean, I'm just I was just brainstorming. I was literally just gonna do like prison style, like a dash. Yeah, well, I, I feel like star is a little more uh, fun. You want to put stars. Do we have stickers? I, I, we I don't. I don't think we have stickers. Do, do we know that for sure? I mean, you can look, but I don't think we have any stickers. I'm pretty sure we've got what we've got. All right, look. Let's start with. Uh, yeah. Let's move down. Jordan Burns goes back up top to where he was, and we will put uh, Jordan Westberg for the second time this season in man of the match position. Why is his picture so much bigger than everybody else's? I guess it's because, because he is. He was the first one, and I wasn't sure how big to make everybody. And then, I guess Grayson was the second one, and I made. I was like, well, I don't want to make it as big like as kind of overcompensated. Yeah, yeah. There. And then I was like, like well, Grayson's a little you too small. You went a small. little too far the other way with that. <laughs> I, I found a draw on. I stickers? found an orange marker that might. work. What is that? For what? For like stars or something. But I think you're gonna run out of room, particularly in this very tiny well, picture of Grayson like Rodriguez. How many? All right. Well, then we'll we'll adjust. Maybe we'll. Redo. Uh, All right. Well, go ahead then. That's if you want to draw, if you want to draw some stars up there, we need to give okay. two to both Corbin Burns and Grayson Rodriguez. They've both been, and now Jordan Westberg joins them in the two-time Man of the Match Club, as uh, he was, of course, the hero last night. Orioles fall behind five-zero. Everything's looking grim, looking bleak. What? There's Jordan Westberg right there, and then. Get a rally going, get back into it, score three runs. I guess. I don't know. Whatever. I feel like we probably should have thought it out ahead of time. Maybe should have had a conversation in a pre-show meeting, well, something along those lines. What would the point of that? Yeah, I know. Why would we? Why would we do any of that? There you go, Jordan West. Looking good. All right. Man of the match last evening. So look, um, it. It clearly wasn't a good night for Jackson Holiday. You know, he'll be able to run. say that. Great. Um, Needed that for my fantasy team. I probably You probably could have used more than one run from Jackson Holiday for your I fantasy team. I, I definitely Didn't could've. get that. 
didn't get that. Instead, you got uh, a rough night. A rough, rough night, in fact, all around. A couple of strikeouts, dropping the, I guess they don't call it a drop because I don't think his glove made contact with it, but, I mean, that was brutal, which allowed the first run to score. Tony Kemp would have made that play. I mean, you, you, you laugh, but seeing the play he made the night before, I think I would confidently say that Tony Kemp would have made that play. I, I mean, I do wonder why none of the outfielders were making more of a charge. And they were, like, I get it that Jackson Holiday was starting to call them off, but, like, dude, that's not his ball. Like, that's your ball. You're coming into it. I don't know if that was like a, hey, he's the kid, let him have his moment type of deal, but, like, somebody should have said, hey, dude, we're going to keep running hard to try to get to that and avoid the collision. But it is on Jackson that he was calling them off like he had it when he definitely did not have it. You'd like to think that all was first game jitters last night and that he kind of works through all of that and everything's going to be good to go. I am certainly not going to overreact to one game. And as we talked about, I think we all know there's going to be an adjustment period for Jackson Holiday. And we've talked about the, the value of that adjustment period coming early in the season versus late in the season when you're trying to finish a World Series push. So I think it's actually even bigger – the fact that he doesn't have to stew about his role in a loss. Because for a young kid, you could see where if that game continues to go the wrong way and he was unproductive and he a, a defensive lapse allows for a run to score and you strike out a couple of times and even the one RBI is in part a wasted opportunity because there was a rally going with runners on second and third and you could have used a big hit to try to keep that thing moving along if he's stewing on those things and it's a loss then you think maybe that could sort of sit with him the wrong way the fact that the Orioles ended up coming back to win I think goes a long way to get him to say okay all's good here I, I'm on the team where that stuff doesn't stay with you for forever where you're going to be picked up even if you make a mistake. So I do think that was, in for esoteric reasons, important on a night where Jackson Holiday was, let's be, again, let's be frank, very bad. <laughs> it was a very bad night for Jackson Holiday. But that's okay. There are going to be very bad nights. It happens to guys that have been around for a very long time. It happens to the best players in baseball. It is a game where you fail more than you succeed. These things occur. Save the good nights for this weekend in Baltimore. Like, get these out of the way now. Maybe that's the idea that Mike Elias had. Right. Start them on the road, have a couple of S nights, and then by the time we get to Baltimore and all the T-shirts are being given away, then he's ready to go to have huge performances. Might be brilliant. Might be y'all are playing checkers, Mike Elias is playing chess type of stuff over there. So I assume that he'll be in the lineup again tonight. They are facing another right-hander. Um, as the Orioles look for the sweep of the Red Sox, Grayson Rodriguez on the mound against Garrett Whitlock. Whitlock off to a good start to the season, but, you know, so is Grayson Rodriguez. He's off to an outstanding start to the season. Um, you know, if you're looking for a bigger takeaway from last night, like if I was writing a column about last night, I, I think the big takeaway over the course of the last week is Colton Cowser, right? Like the big takeaway is – that this is the guy that's demanding it. And I, I won't get me. I had someone try to do this with me last night on Twitter. Like, aren't you feeling silly about the things that you said about Austin Hayes? No, not remotely. I don't think Austin Hayes is dead. By the way, he muscled up a ball last night. The ballpark just happened to hold. Um, I think Austin Hayes is very much still a factor, but at the moment, yeah, I get it. Colton kowser has got to be in the lineup. And left field looks like the spot where he can play. And so, yeah, it's probably going to cost Austin Hayes that opportunity. Now, we all know the way the Orioles operate, whether it's Brandon Hyde, Mike Elias, or both of them. They don't just do the bit where you're on the team, but you don't play. They find ways to get you into games. So I'm going to guess that you guys are going to be frustrated at some point because Austin Hayes is going to be in a lineup. I, I would guess that he'll be in the lineup on Friday night 
when they face D.L. Hall. I think you can assume that he'll be in the lineup on Friday night. I, I'm not writing Austin Hayes off in any capacity. But at the moment, Colton Kowser deserves to continue being in the lineup, and he might be earning regular playing status. Now, that would be difficult for Austin Hayes having trade value. He's not playing every day. Hard to showcase his trade value. And at some point, you just might have to accept that if you were to trade Austin Hayes, he is a throw-in on a deal. The problem being, who's the team that you that's taking Austin Hayes as a throw-in that's in the circumstances that you're looking for? Because you're looking for a team that's not in, in it so now you're looking for a very unique scenario at the trade deadline, a team that's not in it, but might be in it next year. And that's really what you're looking for. That's, that's not going to do anything this year, but maybe next year they believe they could be there. And yet, despite that, they want to give you some, an asset that could help them. So you're probably uniquely looking at a rental piece. And I don't know that... Even as good as we think the Orioles could be, I still don't know what the appetite is for rental pieces, although in fairness, that's what Corbin Burns is, so it depends on how much else you're trading. These things have a tendency to work themselves out. Colton Cowser deserves to play more right now. Does that mean that in a month he's still going to be the guy, or in a month is Austin Hayes going to be swinging the hot bat again? Don't have those answers. Who's going to be hurt a month from now? Don't have those answers. But right now... Yeah, Colton Kowser looks like a dude that deserves to play. And that was the opinion that a lot of us had coming into the season because he's a young guy and you want to get him out there. But veterans earn that opportunity. The reality is Colton Kowser's stolen it away. For now. For now. Again, continue to remember, it's a small sample size. Nothing is fluid. N nothing... Other than Jackson Holiday, if Gunnar Henderson's fluid, Adley Rutschman's fluid, Jackson Holiday's fluid, everything else to be determined. That's, I mean, for now, Anthony Santander is fluid, but he's not here long term, so I don't know how fluid that is. Not long term yet. Not yet, no, but that's the reality. Until that changes, I don't know that I can say it's fully fluid, other than. At the moment, Anthony Santander is going to be in the lineup far more often than he's not. And I guess I guess you'd say the same about Ryan Mountcastle at the moment. And I feel like Jordan Westberg is going to settle in. I, I, I get it. Like the, it's, it's funny because the two home runs stand out, but on the whole, Jordan Westberg's not he hasn't been wildly productive. He's still good enough defensively. And plays multiple positions, and that's always gonna. Yeah, well, I don't. That part doesn't. I, I, there aren't to me. There aren't multiple positions available anymore. Yeah, I guess that's that's also a good point. Like th I like Jordan Westberg's versatility, but no longer is that something that's going to play. Jackson Holiday is the second baseman now. Gunnar Henderson's the shortstop. There's one spot available for Jordan Westberg. He needs to be a very good third baseman in, until that changes. And by the way, as a lot of people have brought up, maybe next year that does change. Maybe ultimately the Orioles really do view Jackson Holiday as a shortstop and Gunnar Henderson as their third baseman. They just didn't want to screw with that coming into this season because of how well Gunnar Henderson played. But until that point, Jordan Westberg is the third baseman. And he needs to get comfortable playing third base. And I think they'll give him that opportunity to get comfortable playing third base for the most part, too. So um, we'll see how that looks moving forward. Cole Irvin, not great. Did get through five again. I, I'm not saying that has no value, but when you get through five giving up ten base runners, that's got no value. I mean, he got his ass kicked. That's a that's a that's a two point oh whip. Are there alternatives right now? I mean, no, there aren't. I mean I say there aren't. C Cade Povich maybe is your alternative if he continues to pitch well in Norfolk. Um and yeah, like you're gonna monitor obviously both John Means and Kyle Bradish, but it's pretty cool. Bradish is pitching. Yeah, I'm still easing up on all that. I'm still, like, even going on a rehab assignment to me is not making me confident that Kyle Bradish is going to pitch for the Baltimore Orioles this season. I, they're all positive signs, 
they're more encouraging than they are discouraging. But I am very much operating in this is found money, and I will believe it when I see it. But yeah, it's a problem. The Cole Irvin thing's a problem. We can't hide from it. You were hoping that the pitches that he added this offseason would, would make him a different dude. I mean, he's getting his ass kicked. Yes, you kind of have no choice but to keep letting him get his ass kicked, at least for now. The Orioles play, you know, six straight games. They kind of don't have a choice. Well, let me double check on They play on Monday? Mm. They do play on – yeah, they play on Monday. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah so they don't have a choice. He's going to have to make his next start. I don't know what it looks like after that. Is there – no, it's two back-to-back Thursdays off. So, yeah, he would have yeah, to – presumably, six, six days. presumably he's got to make two more starts in April – before Minimum, you're yeah. before you're even considering something else, I think Keegan Aiken's been too good in the role they've used him in to reconsider whether or not he could be a spot starter. He's been really good. I mean, he's been really. I know he two balls that got blasted last night that just happened to be held by the ballpark and Colton Kalser. Nice night for Colton Kalser. Real shame that Jordan Westberg hit the hardest, the furthest home run I've ever seen in my life. Yes, it was a very nice night for your boy. Yeah, you need this yeah. picture on the wall. Yeah, we're not going to do that. What do you mean? We might put it up there with it or something. But Maybe put his face on the... No. We're gonna Why wouldn't we do that? Because he's he's a man. He's not, not a he's not a cow. He's a man. Come after me. I'm what's, a man. What's his I'm name? 40. I understand that. He's a man. Um, y- You know, I, 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 you're, you're stuck with it, I think, for two more starts. I think the end of April is when you take a look at where John Means is, or at that point, if Cade Povich is continuing to pitch well enough, you consider the possibility of letting him make the starts until Means is ready. I think you're stuck with two more starts from Cole Irvin. Now, as I say that, remember, the Orioles made the move after three starts a year ago, as John Mioli reminded us earlier in the week. They didn't waste time. Three starts, and they kind of didn't care where they were. They were getting Cole Irvin out of the rotation last year. So, you know, if it's this bad, they could just say, hell, if we got a bullpen a game, we'll just bullpen a game. We're, we're not going to keep sending a guy out there to get his brains beat in. It's a bummer. It's a giant bummer. You, you, you want You want Cole Irvin, because he's got to start, to be pitching. I, nobody's rooting against Cole Irvin, but it just ain't working. It ain't working. It is worth pointing out that Keegan Aiken is off to a great start to the season. Again, a little bit of luck mixed in there last night, but he also struck out four dudes. Like he, it was weird. Diamond he, looked better. What he fa- Cole Irvin faced, or sorry, Keegan Aiken faced seven batters, right? He had the yes. one walk, two balls that were tattooed, and then four strikeouts. Go figure. Right. Um, yeah, Bauman was definitely much better uh last night than he had been. You know, clearly. Um and K- Craig Kimbrell had an uneventful ninth inning, a uh, couple of strikeouts. Craig Kimbrell for the most part this season has looked very good. I mean, I you know, the one blown save, but as we talked about, it was a dink with a couple of stolen bases. Craig Kimbrell so far has looked very sharp for the Orioles. They have not at all pushed it with his usage. As we talked about, you know, could they have put him back out there for at least the start of the 10th inning on Saturday when they were trying to lock up a series win? I get it. He had pitched back-to-back games, and so they really don't want to push it with his usage. I I wondered how many times he was going to pitch back-to-backs this season. He pitched back-to-backs on Friday and Saturday. I, I think they're right right now, very small sample size, you're largely happy with what you've seen from Craig Kimbrell. I still think they need more because of how limited his usage is going to be, and that's what we saw play out on Saturday. Because you can't push it any further, you need more reliable arms. It's not – Craig Kimbrell can be one of them, but I still think you need more of them. All in all, hell of a night. All in all, really fun night 
last night in Boston as the Orioles win the series, clinch the series win with that 7-5 victory coming from down 5-0. We're going to talk draft here in one second. Today's show is brought to you by Atman's Deli. We are so excited about the new Atman's Deli in Harbor Point. It's everything you love about Atman's, but now they also have a full bar. With TVs, the opportunity for you to come hang out, watch the games, just make Atman's your spot. You get everything that you love about the original Atmans, the family atmosphere, the delicious food, the corned beef piled high, the soups, the desserts, hand-rolled bagels in the morning, a full pickle bar, and a full-service bar. Atmansdeli.com is the website for you to check out their daily specials. Find out what's going on at the brand-new Atmans Deli in Harbor Point. We are just two weeks out exactly from the NFL draft. Gets underway two weeks from tonight in Detroit. Joining us now, our press box NFL draft analyst. He is our friend Joe Serpico, and he's back with us on GCR. Joe, it's Glenn. It's good to chat with you. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning. Absolutely, guys. Anytime. It's good to hear from you guys as well. Yeah, we're still waiting on something. I told I told my buddy, you know, I couldn't make it in there today because I'm up here in Upper Harper County, but I'm a man of my word. I will get that done for you. I all promise. All right, you. all right. We need a little more. We need a little more push there. We need a little more push. Hey, uh, Joe, who's the guy whose opinion you has changed the most for you since when this process began at the end of the college football season to now on the precipice of the draft? Who's the guy whose opinion about you evolved on the most? Are we talking like in, in, in general, general or in general, about in general? Okay. All right. In general, uh, I, for me, I mean, I, well, I would have to say Xavier Worthy after seeing what he did at the combine there, you know, the way he ran, I think that kind of shot him up from a, uh, you know, let's say a second or third round pick to a potential guy that could be going, let's say as early as 20 to our, to wide receiver needy teams. You know, anytime you see a performance like that, that kind of, uh, you know, rings alarm bells for everybody. And, and it, it made a, a scene around the league. I'm pretty sure like every GM was impressed by that. And we all know, you know, speed kills in this day and age. Everybody wants the uh, next Tyreek Hill. Um, and a lot of links to him going to Kansas City for that reason, you know, pairing him up with Mahomes. Uh, obviously in Baltimore, we're hoping that's not the case. But if you have to say anybody, for me, it would definitely be him. I am, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I wonder if the Ravens go wide. And I, I think we're expecting the Ravens take a wide receiver, maybe not in the first round, but fairly early. I, I It just doesn't feel like the speed guy. It feels like that that's the role that Zay Flowers has to play for this team. And that if they were looking for a wide receiver, they'd probably be looking for more of the prototype, you know, the, the, the big, the 6'4", the guy with the big catch radius. I just don't know necessarily that I'm – there's one guy that after you get past the top of the draft that I have sort of – I know Keon Coleman's name comes up a ton. I, I just don't know necessarily who I think that is if it isn't with the 30th pick in the draft. Yeah, I'm under – you know, it's been, I believe now, three receivers in the past five years. I would be hard-pressed to find them do it again this year, even though you know, it sounds like uh, Bateman – is an improvement year, so it could be a possibility that you know they need to find somebody as early as next year. But I think there's just more pressing needs. But yeah, there are some guys at the top of the board. You mentioned uh, Keon Coleman; he's somebody that I'm kind of big on. Uh, I'm a big fan of Xavier Leggett, the South Carolina guy. He's more of your like your bigger guy, which is perfect complement to what you said about Zay Flowers. You can maybe say the same about a uh, Donnie Mitchell as well. Um, one of my favorite prospects is like in the later, let's say the second round, is uh, Roman Wilson out of Michigan. I think. He's one of those guys, similar to what we're hearing about with uh, J.J. McCarthy. You know, they didn't throw the ball a whole lot, so you didn't really get to see just how good he is. But when you saw the tape and, you know, you kind of saw the measurements and all that, he's definitely somebody I think is going to make an impact in the next level. Joe, I have come around on the I am not – like, if you asked me to, to bet it, I would almost bet the Ravens don't use the 30th pick in the NFL draft at this point, with the theory for me being that their, their most pressing needs – are offensive linemen and edge rush. And I just don't know that the player that's sitting there at 30 is significantly better than the player that's going to be there, say, at 45. So I, I phrase the question this way. In those two spots, edge rush 
and O line, and I'm I'm including both tackle and guard because I think they need help in both areas. Who are the guys that if they are there at thirty, you don't mess around because the guy that would be there that that would still be there at forty two isn't as good as this guy specifically. It's not worth trading out of the pick. Uh, the one guy who I think is you, you just plug and play would be ideal fit is uh, the tackle out of Alabama's J.C. Latham. Uh, he's a right tackle by trade, so you could literally slide him in in the spot that's vacated by Morgan Moses right now. Uh, he's that one guy. If he's somehow there at 30, yes, I'm jumping at the bit. You just, you, there's no way you trade back. Then you have Amarius Mims out of Georgia. Uh, he's kind of going to be floating around kind of in that range. I don't know if he's still going to be there around 45. Uh, you have to like that the, you know, the obvious ties with uh, Todd Monk in there. So he's another one of those guys who can kind of be plug and play. Uh, but I, you're right. Other than those two spots there, you can just kind of trade back to, let's say, like 10 picks and then do exactly what you said. You can kind of stockpile a couple picks because, you know, as we get closer, we know that there's going to be Michael Penix talk is going to start to creep into that, you know, potential first round pick. Mm-hmm. Ravens in the ideal spot at number 30 there to, to trade back. If one of those teams wants to take on the. You know, that extra fifth year, let's say, I mean, if the Vikings strike out on whatever they're doing there, or maybe even the Giants, uh, one of those teams there. So that I could see that as a strong possibility as, as moving back. As far as, as edge goes, um, I mean, there's not really any. I mean, if some, for some reason, let's say like a Latou or uh, Jared Verse that happens to fall for you, yes, you got to go have one of those right. guys. But then everybody else, I kind of have, like you said, kind of graded out as in your, like, let's say 33 through almost 50 who are, you know, very similar, especially when it comes to the edge rushers. He is press box NFL draft analyst, Joe Serpico. He's with us here on GCR. So Joe, in that group of edge rushers in that 33 to 50 range, right? Like who, who do you still think is impactful? And like, I, I, I'll give you, I'm just going to roll out a name because he's a local kid, Chris Braswell, right? Like why aren't guys like that more highly thought of? Like what is the knock? Why is that group in that range instead of being, more definitively first rounders. Well, Braswell was actually the name I was going to bring up. It's funny. Because any guy who's also from Alabama is, if one, we know the lineage from that, but two, sure. they just also fit the system here as well. So it just makes too much sense. And then, you know, you just mentioned the local ties as well. So we have Braswell, somebody I kind of had as like their second round pick in the 60s there. But, you know, let's say you do drop back in a, uh, a Chop Robinson somehow sitting there at, say, 35. Uh, that's the guy that I'm kind of interested in now. A lot of people are kind of that's, wait, you know, can, can I, that's, that's interesting. Oh, hey, hang on a second, Joe. That's interesting. You Go. you you like Chop Robinson early in the second round, but w- you wouldn't necessarily like him at thirty. Not if I could get him at let's say thirty six and pick okay. up an extra couple picks. Like I said, from you know from the Giants to who kind of sound like they could be in the market for a Penix. Uh, that would definitely be somebody that you know because I think he can still be there. That's more of the thing. I, I don't think it's necessarily you know he's somebody I need at thirty if. I could move back pretty, pretty confident that he'll be there. If he's not, I kind of like Darius Robinson, um, but he's kind of a different role. Chop is more of your pass rusher. Uh, Darius Robinson's more of your, like, your stout defensive end. Then you got Jonas Ellis from Utah, potentially. You know, there's another guy as well that you can go with. Um, but I'm more under the belief that I, I'm a big fan of Braswell just because, like I said, those Alabama guys, they fit the system that they already have. And that's uh, one of those guys that if he's there, let's say, you know, anywhere between 36 and and 50, yeah, by all means, that's somebody they should go after for sure. Joe, the uh, the other spot that I think, like, a- again, if those are the two top needs, I think cornerback would be third. They could use the depth still. That This is a team that has always believed to build from outside in, when it, in at least in the Eric DaCosta era of building defenses. Walk me through both, like, what you think the options would be at corner at 30. Like, who's the guy that even if you have bigger needs – if if this corner is sitting there at 30, you take them and then give me the, like, idea of if it's something else, if it is offensive line or edge rush first, who are the guys maybe in the second round that you still like at that point? A uh, guy who potentially could be there at 30, uh, it, that's really a reach. But if he's available, I think he's one of those guys that the Ravens do got to jump on, and that's uh, Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. It sounds like he's probably going to go somewhere between 20 and 25. Uh, but if he's somehow there, I think he's a guy that you, you kind of got to scoop up right away. Uh, Kamari Lasseter is another one that could potentially go in the first round. That could be, again, you know, just because of the fit with, uh, I know it's the other side of the ball, but, you know, they're going to be a little bit more biased to Georgia players with Munkin in the fold. And then one of my favorite guys, I know we talked about him in the past, is Enix Rakestraw. 
Uh, he's kind of mm-hmm. all over the place as of late when you see uh, these projections. I've seen him, you know, go in the first round. I've seen him be a second-round pick. Uh, so he's a guy that you know could be an option for Ravens at both of those positions there. Now, if you're looking for more, let's say, second-round options, you have uh, Max Melton out of Rutgers. There's Kalen Carson out of Wake Forest. There's just a couple guys that I've kind of keyed in on. Um, there's an, also another one from Michigan, Mike uh, – I, I, I know I'm going to – butcher his last name we're going to say mike s from michigan he's another one again with the local ties from michigan i think that's kind of what i wrote down in my notes here anything between alabama michigan and georgia right, it just yeah. pay attention instantly with these teams yeah. you know so it's always like you know they're, they they're always guys you've got to keep an eye on as potential fits with the ravens well, but yeah I, those are kind of the guys i like there and then andrew phillips and cam hart are more your like third round guys and and, and obviously notably it's not just that they have you know connections it's that those are very good programs that produce an awful lot well, of talent Yes, as well. Yep. Um, uh, just a couple. I mentioned um, Chris Brazo. I want to get your thoughts on on just a couple other like local names. We're going to chat with Bo Braid a little bit later on this morning. The uh, the safety from the University of Maryland. I'm not trying to make Bo Braid Kyle Hamilton by any stretch of the imagination because Kyle Hamilton is a different animal. But it does feel like there's a little bit of like a poor man's Kyle Hamilton almost there, where like he he, he does play. Uh, uh, you know, sort of like the modern, you know, weapon weaponized version of the safety position. Yeah, he's the guy I've uh, mocked to the Ravens quite a bit when I'm doing these mocks. The, obviously, the local ties kind of uh, play into factor there. But I think it's also no secret that the Ravens also are, they it's not as pressing of a need as what we just talked about at cornerback, the tackle, and uh, edge. But you know, they do need a backup safety now, somebody who can. You know, God forbid something were to happen to Kyle Hamilton, you can kind of plug and play somebody. And, yeah, I agree with you totally there. Like, Braden's this guy who, you know, you can kind of develop maybe for a year or so, a plug and play, maybe on some nickel situations, because let's face it, uh, the, you know, the nickel spot is going to be, uh, unless Hamilton is locked into that role, they're going to need to find somebody to play, uh, take on that role. And Braid, because of the local ties, I think is obviously somebody that can be in consideration there. Let's say rounds like four, uh, fifth, I think, might be a stretch. I think he's going to be somewhere around that fourth-round range. Uh, Cam Hart, the cornerback from Notre Dame, who's a Baltimore native, ended up going to good counsel. And I, someone who, again, I, when I've watched, I've always thought he was a very good football player. I, 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 tell me why he isn't more highly regarded. Uh, I just think this is actually you – know, it, uh, it's a deeper class of cornerbacks than I think a lot of people are talking about. Um, I actually like this cornerback group. I think a lot of people are kind of dismissing some of these cornerbacks. Uh, you know, Terry on Arnold, I'm a big, big fan of. Uh, he's just not in range for the Ravens whatsoever. Uh, he kind of reminds me like a spitting image of uh, Marlon Humphrey. Same thing with uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry, to be really honest. But for Cam Hart, you know, it's just, he just kind of falls in line where, you know, he just kind of gets bumped down because of all the depth there is. I mean, there are some definite, like, tackles kind of heavy. Um, receivers very heavy. And it's just kind of like cornerback, I think, is like your third in line when you're talking about uh, position groups there. So, obviously, you know, needs kind of play a factor. But Cam Hart is somebody who, you know, I've seen go anywhere from between the third round to the fifth round. So, it's all kind of, you know, personal preference there. But uh, Cam Hart would definitely be a guy that I would, again, be kind of interested in because of the obvious local ties. And uh, you know he would love to play here as well. Yeah, it would obviously mean a whole lot. All right, uh, give me one wild card. As we're two weeks out from draft night, something that you think could flip the entire first round on its head. I think everybody is so focused on the Vikings moving up with the Chargers, and it does make sense. Don't get me wrong. I think it does make a lot of sense. But I think we're not hearing, and it was kind of rumored a little bit earlier on, but it's kind of died down as the talk is, what if the Arizona Cardinals decide they go quarterback and decide to trade Kyler Murray Mm. to the Minnesota Vikings? Mm. That's like the the thing I've been kind of keeping an eye on. Let's say, you know, the Arizona kind of wants to – do a reset there, you know, then you take, let's say, they, you know, say they want J.J. McCarthy, and you trade off Murray for a couple more picks. Uh, maybe you get, I don't know if you're going to get a, one of those first-round picks off of uh, the Vikings because of that, uh, but it's one of those things where it's an established quarterback. Minnesota is trying to win now. Arizona's got a couple years to go, so, you know, you're paying this quarterback one of the largest contracts in the league right now, and you're not in contention. Let's just face it, they're just not. So, I think that's one of the things we need to be keeping more of an eye on. I can see them parting ways with Murray taking J.J. McCarthy, and then the Vikings, you know, they can use those two first-round picks that they've acquired to kind of build around uh, Kyler Murray because you already have Justin Jefferson. Let's, you know, beef up that team as much as you can to make the run while 
Why you still got Jefferson in the fold? Because that's a whole other topic that hasn't been uh, settled yet. All right. At Joe Serp is how you follow him on Twitter. You can see all of his stuff at PressBoxOnline.com. And they continue churning out content almost daily leading up to the NFL draft. Joe Serpico will talk again as we get closer. Thanks for taking the time this morning. Anytime, guys. Take care. That's Joe Serpico, PressBox NFL draft analyst with us here on GCR. Don't forget the place to look for all of the high school sports coverage. Everything you need, scores, schedules, standings. Play Pick'em over at countysports.zone, and it's all proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer and by a Toyota.com. We're going to talk a little bit more about Jackson Holiday after his MLB debut last night. His uncle, Josh Holiday, the baseball coach at Oklahoma State, will join us here in a couple of minutes. It's a Thursday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Hey, it's Jeremy Kahn. This postseason, bet in person at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks with locations in Canton and in Towson and enjoy the best in-class sports wagering experience at their state-of-the-art facilities, bringing an unmatched sports betting thrill. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan-favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. Make the most out of every day in your Toyota RAV4. Available in hybrid or gas-only models. A RAV4 can get you where you want to go in style. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new RAV4s from your local Toyota dealer today. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money. I love you more every day. Well then, don't get a speeding ticket this trip, okay? Sign up for Rofo Rewards and upgrade to Rofo Pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at the Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria. A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. Two dollars of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. One of the things that's definitely wrong with this country is that this dude still has a job somehow, some way. Glenn Clark. I'm going to share this uh, merely as a statement of fact and offer nothing else behind it. Um, It was announced this morning that O.J. Simpson has passed away. Uh, Apparently uh, had cancer and died because of that. Um, I I don't I have no interest in saying anything other than that, but obviously an infamous uh, human O.J. Simpson has passed away today. 
All right. It is a Thursday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. Uh, I want to thank all of you for stepping up and filling our master's pool yesterday. In fact, we had so many that I had to kick Drew out of it, and there were still others that wanted to get in. And I was like, maybe we do another pool, but I was working last night, and I didn't have time to be chasing after people. So we left it at one. 200 bucks raised that will go to the Key Bridge Fund. The w- the winner will get 200 bucks. Very simple. If you don't know who your golfers are, if you got in and you didn't see a message from me, hit me up. Uh, I've got them. I can let you know who you should be rooting for this weekend at the Masters. But whoever wins the Masters, if you've got that golfer, then you will win the $200. And again, the other $200 goes to the Key Bridge Fund. So major thank you for getting involved it's so effing bizarre how they do this with the Masters where, like, you can watch the Masters on, like, one of 18 different apps. And what part of the Masters they're allowed to show you, I don't know. I don't know. I think, like, one of these apps is allowed to show you the 15th hole. One of these apps is allowed to show you a feature group. One of these apps is allowed to show you, I, I don't know, maybe what's directly behind them from wherever they're – it's so – effing bizarre it's i don't even have the words for how bizarre it is at three o'clock you can watch the masters on espn if i remember correctly okay you can't watch until three o'clock until three o'clock you have to go to one of these apps now i don't care at all about the masters so this is not really a problem for me this is not like the 920 thing with the uh, national championship game that i was bitching about the other night where like it's a problem for me i don't really care But I would think that the people that do care have always found this befuddling. I feel like we've talked about it before with Drew. Like, once upon a time, it was about the pompous nonsense. And by the way, part of that is why I don't like the Masters. I don't like any of the golf tournaments, but I particularly don't like the Masters because of the we're better, the entitlement of it all. Like, we're better than you. We're the Masters. We're, like, get the entire, who, you're a, you're an effing golf tournament. Again, for golf people, oh, no, 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 how dare you say that? It's the Azaleas. I mean, get the F out of here. It's a golf tournament. God bless. I like tennis. I love Wimbledon. I think it's stupid AF that Wimbledon forces everyone to wear white at all times. It does zero for me. It does not add to it. It detracts from my enjoyment of Wimbledon. That they force the everyone they wear to wear white. That the, everyone has to wear white and nothing else. It, it detracts from my enjoyment. I, I will never. It's the entitlement. It's the we are better than you. It's the all of it. I'll ne- I'm never an, a fan of it. Will never be. You're a golf tournament. I get it. A golf tournament a lot of people enjoy. And their belief is that the reason why a lot of people enjoy it is because of the entitlement. Because... They remind you how much better they are than you. But I would think that for the people that want to watch it, they they would like to know, here's how you watch it. And it doesn't even bother me that like it would be on a an app because that's where everything is in 2024. But like which one and what can you watch? Good luck. If you're trying to follow along with your golfers today, good luck, at least until three o'clock. If your golfers play this morning, again. Good luck. Just, I don't know, check the check the score bug or something, and you should be able to get updates on how your golfers are doing. But the most important part is that you all got in and you filled the pool, and that's what we needed you to do in order to take care of uh, making a nice donation to the Key Bridge Fund. So thank you very, very much for doing exactly that. I don't know when we might do another one of these things. The Olympics doesn't do anything for me. Just do it every uh, every golf tournament every weekend. No, 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 no chance. No chance. Whatever's that next, and no, none, zero chance. Now the majors, maybe, but again, it's just more. It requires me to put out more emotional effort than I actually have. We can't do a tennis one. I, the problem is tennis is so top heavy. Like, you can sell yourself on the idea that there's a lot of golfers that have a chance of winning a tournament. There aren't a lot of tennis players that have a chance of winning a tournament. There just aren't. So it makes it 
it makes it far more difficult to do one for that. But if you've got ideas and if you've got charities that you want us to help raise money for, tell us, and we'll see if we can't come up with something for it. So I appreciate you all getting in, and again, we'll make a nice donation to the Key Bridge Fund. All right, it was a special night in Boston last night as Jackson Holiday made his Major League debut. Orioles rallied from down 5 nothing to beat the Red Sox. Joining us now, we've had him on before, a man that I have no doubt would have preferred that like Jackson be playing for him for the last couple of years, but I think he's pretty excited about it as well. He is Jackson's uncle and the baseball coach down at Oklahoma State. It's a pleasure for us to welcome back into the program Josh Holiday, who's with us now here on GCR. Josh, it's uh, Glenn in Baltimore. It's great to chat with you. Thank you for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning. Yeah, my pleasure. You bet. Uh, Coach, I know you're in the throes of your own season. you got your own things going on. But, you know, w- what did it mean to you, to the entire family, to see Jackson get to have this moment where, you know, that work that he's put in has paid off at a very young age? <clears throat> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I don't know that uh... – I don't know that anyone uh, could have envisioned Jackson handling himself as well as he has. I mean, we all knew he was mature and special and talented and all these things coming out of high school. That was pretty clear to all of us. But what he's done as a professional uh, has been remarkable. And uh, to see him kind of take on the minor leagues last year and run all the way to to AAA was was amazing. And then uh, the way he went to spring training this year and Quite honestly, uh, he went there to make the team, and uh, he wants to help the Orioles win. And I think he was disappointed when he got sent down, but he handled it with a level of uh, professionalism and understood. And then when he got the call, I think he was excited to to go join his teammates and try to help the Orioles win. And, you know, I think that's the bottom line now. When you're in the big leagues, you're there to win, and the Orioles won last night. So I would think he would probably tell you, uh, that was the greatest part of, of the story. Uh, Coach, you know, I, I think so much is made about Jackson's story and how much he's been around baseball. And, you know, we've seen every picture and video of him at a very, very young age. And it's it's interesting because the juxtaposition is within baseball circles, he was also kind of seen as a, a, a late bloomer at, at this level, right? Like that he didn't really become this until later in his high school career. When did you realize, like, I know that you always, you know, wanted to have him play for you, but when did you realize, oh, he really is good enough that I'm probably not going to get that chance? Well, I think one of the most amazing videos I've ever seen of Jackson is one shot, and I believe he might have been two years old. Um, I think Matt's holding him in a Colorado Rockies uniform, and Matt has a full head of hair. And uh, Jackson is actually swinging a bat at either, you know, one or two. He could barely old enough to walk. And if you just watch the way he's, his initial swing from the time he was a little bitty guy, he had the most beautiful, flat, natural swing. And I'll never forget watching him swing. I remember thinking, God, he, he, he swings a baseball bat exactly how you'd want to swing it. And watching him grow up from that age on, he loved baseball. He always had a bat in his hand, a glove on his hand. And, uh, you know, Jackson's skill level was apparent to me, I think, probably before it was to the rest of the world. Hmm. I think when the rest of the world caught on to him was when he got strong. And, and that, that happened more of his junior and senior year of high school. Uh, he went from this graceful, skilled, amazing baseball player uh, to the best prospect in baseball. So I think the strength is when it kicked in. Uh, the skill, the grace, uh, the the composure, the poise, the intelligence. Uh, I never saw him strike out ever. He would never swing out of the strike zone. I mean, he just did things that kids don't do. And, uh, you know, to be honest with you, this is Jackson's path. As thrilled as we'd be if he were here wearing our orange and black. Uh, he was meant to wear the orange and black he's wearing. Love and that. I think that's pretty remarkable. Love that. That is tremendous. Coach Josh Halliday from Oklahoma State with us here on GCR. Um, Coach, I, I wonder what you made of all the, the hubbub about Jackson moving to second base and, you know, the adjustment period. Knowing what you know about him and his baseball instincts, did you have any doubt in your mind that he would be able to do this quickly and, and even particularly quickly at a high level, the highest level of baseball, to make this adjustment? <clears throat> well, I think uh, Jackson's a baseball player. Um, I think his mindset is to do whatever the team needs him to do to win. 
And so baseball players with that mindset adjust and adapt because uh, that's what's needed. So he worked at it this winter. He'll continue to get better at it every day because that's the kind of player that he is. Uh, it's a hard position. Second base is probably maybe one of the most underappreciated positions with the difficulty of the angles, the pivot, uh, and just throwing from a different side of the field. So I think it's a great position and a valuable one and one that an athlete like himself could really make a difference at. So he'll uh, he'll keep getting better. He'll keep learning. He'll keep growing in the position. And in the meantime, uh, that's what that ball club needs him to do. And so, you know, from that standpoint, he'll commit his whole uh, focus on to doing what the team needs. Coach, you know, baseball is a game of failure, right? And and even the greatest players of all time failed in the, more than they succeed. Um, given his background and how much he's been able to absorb from you, from Matt, just being around this sport for the entirety of his life, it, there's been much made about the adjustment period for any rookie, not, you know, not uniquely for Jackson, but for anyone who comes up, particularly at a young age. How much do you feel like maybe he has an advantage for handling the adjustment period and, you know, whatever failures they might be, maybe a tough night in a debut, even then like your typical rookie in Major League Baseball? <clears throat> well, I, I think he'll handle it as well as you can because he has a great support system. And so his sounding board will be positive. His, his place he goes for advice will be positive. It'll be educated information. He has a supportive, loving family. Uh, he has people that are behind him, but not people trying to get in front of him. You know, sometimes players arrive at the major league level and people are trying to be part of the story or get a part of whatever it is the player is experiencing. Jackson's family's already been there. That They have already experienced it. They will support him the way loving families should. So he'll have an amazing support system to grow through all the ups and downs that, uh, you know, the life of a big leaguer has. Um, I think what's more exciting for me is the relationships it sounds like he's already formed with his teammates yeah. and the organization. Yeah. Uh, when you can when you can have friendships and other guys on the team you relate to that are your age uh, or you can lean on or have been there and walked in your shoes, what an unbelievable situation to walk into. So I think the, uh, the unbelievable players already on the roster, some of the young superstar players that will no doubt mentor him uh, and the organization that seems to be very much put together the right way. He's, uh, he's probably in a great situation. And all that being said, game is hard, and uh, he'll handle it one day at a time. The, the temperament. We, we made so much about how cool he seems and the conversations we have with him. Like, it just it does not feel like you're talking to a 20-year-old, or even when he was 19 or 18, it didn't feel like that. It, it, does he ever waver? Like, do you ever see, you know, something other than just this simple, cool, nothing phases him guy that we've gotten to know over the course of the last couple of years? No, he's uh, he's a pretty consistent kid. I mean, he's a and he's a young man now. Obviously, he's a grown up. He uh, he's always been a very uh, sweet, loving person and uh, kind to people, kind to uh, you know brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles. He's just a kind kid. He's he's a gentleman, and I think uh, you know the the gentleman nature of who he is uh, really translates well to the game because the game, quite honestly. Uh, requires poise and control and good self-talk and a level head. And uh, I think he has all those intangible qualities as really kind of the base of his personality. The, you know, the other thing that kind of jumps out at me, you mentioned a second ago that you might have seen it before other people did. The idea, you know, the, the strength being what maybe was the determining factor. I think there are still people that have questions about, you know, whether or not Jackson's going to be there immediately as a power hitter. What would you tell us about his ability in that department that maybe we don't know about quite yet just because we haven't seen it? Well, when I said I, I noticed it before others, you know, the <clears throat> the first marker of someone that's going to be a great hitter is if they can line the ball consistently to the opposite field. And, and Jackson hit the ball to the opposite field at such a remarkable clip at a young age. I was shocked. I couldn't believe how good he was at hitting the ball to left field uh, and then as he got stronger, uh, hitting the ball to right center, uh, and then as he put it all together, hitting the ball to all fields uh, consistently, uh, you know, I think most guys will tell you that the good hitter develops first and the power hitter develops second. So I think what uh, fans and, and what you want in the game is a really good young hitter. And then his power and all those things that come later, that's the icing on the cake. Uh, playing competitive and the American League East and obviously across the American League and, and interleague stuff, 
uh, you got to be a good hitter before you're a power hitter. So the game is played too fast. It's too skilled. It's too, you know, the matchups and all the different things. It's just simply too advanced yeah. to, to try to chase power. So uh, he'll do his thing. He'll hit the ball to all fields. Uh, he creates runs. He scores runs. He's fast as, as all get out. I don't think anyone knows how fast he is. Uh, he always hustles. And uh, he's just a really, really good baseball player. And I think over the course of time, uh, all the elements of his game will emerge. I imagine you're hoping that it's going to be a long time before you're going to be able to get to Baltimore, however, to see him. Like, it's it's going to take, you know, maybe like into like mid-June or something like that before you have that opportunity. That would be that would be the preference. <laughs> yeah. I would love to follow him on my phone for the next couple of months and, and see my Cowboys to the finish. Yep. And then the uh, first, first chance we get, we'll be there. No doubt about it. Josh Holiday, congratulations to you, to the entire family. Uh, what a special moment it was. And whenever that day is, you know, we'll, we'll root for you guys, and hopefully it is a, a good long time before we see you here in Baltimore to be able to enjoy it. Thank you for taking the time for us this morning. We really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks for having me on. It's Josh Holiday, the baseball coach at Oklahoma State, and, of course, the uncle of Jackson Holiday who made his debut last night for the Baltimore Orioles. Appreciate him taking the time for us this morning. We are winding down for our number one of GCR. Today's show has also been brought to you by, of course, Ruth Chris. I, I just always pause for a second whenever I even say Ruth Chris. I look down at the sheet, and I'm like, oh, I get to talk about Ruth Chris. Yeah, that's pleasant. Whether you are, you know, entertaining clients, celebrating a very special milestone, or even if you're just taking a date night, it, it doesn't have to be for any reason whatsoever. Just haven't had one in a long time. There's no better place. The moment that she finds out, or he, or both, find out that you're taking them to Ruth's Chris. The smile that you're going to see on their face will be second to none. Count on them to deliver to you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation right now at ruthschris.com. All right, so we still, we, um, we got a busy second hour of the show. Bo Braid's going to join us. A little bit later on. Also, we're going to make our weekly trip to Bowie. And Colin Burns is off to a hot start to the season. Griffin is licking his chops to tell you about UFC 300. This part is going to be awkward because Griffin cares at a 17 and a half. Mm. And you only cared at, at, the I, ten, at a 10. No, I care at about a... Th- if I care at... If most UFC fights or pay-per-views, I care about it at like a, a 3... I would say I care about this one at a four and a half. Like, it's just, there's just nothing on this card. I know it's a loaded card, but there's nothing yeah. that gets me. I, I am, like, I'm kind of into Bo Nickel, you know what I mean? Like, kind of. As you should. But Responsibly he went, so. He, he went to Penn State. Like, I mean, I'm only sort of into Bo Nickel. He's not wrestling at the Olympics, is he? No. No, no unfortunately, no. Kinda, I kind of don't to, care. He wants, to get, he wants to be a UFC champion. I understand that. I just, yeah, you know. It's kind of a whatever. I mean, you could imagine he would have won gold at the Olympics if if he decided to go that route. Uh, sure. So. Well, he would have. Yeah. I, sure, if you say so. He lost. So he lost to David Taylor in the like trials. Right. David Taylor went on to win gold. So. So it's transitive property. Of course. Okay. Got it. So. Without a doubt. Like I'm mildly interested in that, but like everything else is just. You know, it's a good card. I know it's a good card. If. If I was required, like if 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 for example, we were we had we had been asked to come watch the fights at at uh, Sports and Social on Saturday night, mm. and don't forget you can always watch the fights at Sports and Social this Saturday night. You could still reserve your spot to hang out inside Sports and Social for the fights. But if that had been the case, then yeah, I'd say all right, cool. Like I'll have fun. I'll watch the fights. But there's zero chance I'm purchasing none. No chance of that. And I'm also working Saturday night, so like it would require me going out of my way to find somewhere afterwards to go watch the fight. If I have a friend that reaches out, and there's one friend, like whenever John Jones fights, by the way, what's going on with John Jones? What's the story there? I saw uh, something floating around on the internet. Like he got, I don't know what happened there. There's always something. Yeah, there is always something, un- un- unfortunately. It's just, 
drives me nuts. That, um, yeah. I have a buddy that whenever John Jones fights, he hits me up. He's like, dude, let's go to um, you know, th- this location and let's watch the fights. And I'm like, all right, fine. I'll go with you. You got it. Y- you got me. I'll do it. And if he were to reach out to me on Saturday night, like, hey, bro, do you want to go watch the fights? It's possible that I'd choose to do it with him. But it's possible. It's not even a certainty that I would make that choice because it's just where I am. But Griffin badly wants to talk about the fight. So we're going to have to – Griffin sees on the schedule that there's like a whole chunk of time that's open. So he's probably thinking, I'll fill that entire chunk of time talking I about could. UFC I 300. Could. I very much could. No. No. It's not about whether or not you could. You, you don't won't. think I can? It's not about that. Why did you? Well, you, that's telling what you said. You, no, you just said. I'm you telling don't you, think. you won't. You will not. Maybe you could, but you will not. What do you mean, maybe? We're going to do a reasonable fighting word segment and nothing more than a reasonable fighting word segment. We come back in here on GCR. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates. A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Whether you're celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at ruthschris.com. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Discover one of Baltimore's hidden gems at Guilford Hall Brewery. Enjoy dinner in our spacious brew pub. Sip a signature cocktail in our outdoor dog-friendly beer garden. Or take a tour of our brewery. Discover your new favorite local craft beer. From crisp lagers to hoppy ales, there's something for everyone to enjoy. Pair your brew with delicious appetizers and entrees. There are options for the whole family, but you have to try our fan favorite giant pretzel. Guilford Hall Brewery, where every sip is a celebration. Visit us online at guilfordhall.com. The latest edition of Press Box is available now, and on the cover we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolko on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinator Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Pressbox is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. All right, back in here on GCR. So a couple of things really quickly. One, 
the, the, what I did today, I'm telling you, you do not have to say anything at all about O.J. Simpson because he passed away. It does not require you to. It's a lesson that I learned a long time ago. We, we're all so desperate for attention that, like, when something happens, we want our we want our chunk of attention because of it. And look, I do that with lesser things. We all do it. Hell, but I'm talking about other people's performances. I'm not an athlete. This one does not require anything. It is far too complicated. You are not required to say a word or to put out some dank meme or to think that you... It requires nothing. Zero. Way too complicated for you to be capable. At, like, Tory Smith's on there fighting with you. Like, stop. Just, you can say nothing. It's okay to just say nothing. Aside from that. Other news this morning. Scott Drew is apparently not leaving Baylor for Kentucky. Hmm. That, I'm not going to say surprises me because Scott Drew, you know, like he clearly has a lot of investment from a handful of people at Baylor. As I said before, if I were Scott Drew, I would see this as the perfect opportunity to, to have gotten out, to have said, hey, look, as good as I might have things here, there's somewhere where... I'm going to always matter most. And at Baylor, basketball, will you literally can win the national championship. And the, the program, the football program, could never win a national championship. And you still will never be the most important person there. Ever. The morning after Baylor won the national championship in basketball, Scott Drew was not the most important person in the athletics department at Baylor. It's just not the way that it works there. Basketball's, you know, a distraction from football season. And in that part of the country in general, it's that way. I don't know how it is at Houston. I would have to ask Tyus more about that. I would assume that it's still, hey, basketball can be really good, but this is Texas. You know what we actually care about. But I don't actually know that because I don't know enough about Houston. I know enough, and I know enough Baylor people to understand that that they were doing this bit. God, somebody was doing this bit. Maybe maybe part of my take was doing this bit about Alabama. Like, what would an Alabama fan trade a basketball national championship for? Like, would winning a national championship in basketball be would it, would it have the like same value uh, the same value as winning an SEC football championship? Right? Like, they were doing that bit, and I was like, this is a great bit. Like, this is. And and at Baylor, because they don't like at Alabama, they do those things all the time at Baylor. My God, it might be that like making a conference title game in football is more significant than winning a basketball national championship. So I in when I when I saw that Scott Drew is where they were centering their focus, I was like, look, man, I I know that everybody's going to say Scott Drew's got it good. But I really did think that Scott Drew was going to head to Kentucky because that's just too good. But there is an awful lot of oil money, and maybe the awful lot of oil money makes up the difference and makes you say, ah, hell, I don't care that I'll never be the most important person on campus because the oil money is that good. I would have, me personally, I, I just think that Billy Donovan is a phenomenal coach. And so personally, if I was a Kentucky fan, like Dan Hurley, sure, you call Dan Hurley and ask, hey, any chance? But really think Dan Hurley was leaving really but no he's at a place where basketball matters most and in a part of the country where there is yeah. a like there is a recruiting base to tap into that no one else is tapping into like no one has ever Duke is your biggest competition really for New York New Jersey that area Villanova could be again but has dipped a little bit post Jay Wright. It's UConn and like nothing else. Now in this era, recruiting maybe not as significant as it was ten years ago, 
but still nice to know that you're like the preeminent basketball destination for anyone in the Northeast portion of the United States. Billy Donovan, to me, would have always been the guy. Now, it's worth pointing out that Billy Donovan has not coached in college in the NIL era, right? Like, in the tr- in the transfer portal era, he has not coached at the college level. It's been nearly a decade since he coached at the college level. But that would have been my... If I was a Kentucky fan, I would have always wanted Billy Donovan to be the guy. Billy Donovan right now is sort of like, you know, well, you know, they're not. I haven't really heard from him. He's got, what, th- two games left in the season for the Bulls, something like that? The Bulls are a money laundering scheme. I have no idea what they are. Are they in the – they're not in the playoffs, are they? I can't fathom that. <laughs> but you could tell me. I guess the East – players sometimes. Uh, who? Zach Levine. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are you doing with that? You, you winning dunk contest. What, what does that and a nickel have you? <laughs> um, they are the – they're the nine seed right now. So they'd be in the play-in tournament? Yes. I believe they've actually – what does PB mean? I've never seen – these I'm gonna I, go to the I, glossary I, right the here. Playing tournament really screws everything up. Clinched play in berth. Okay, so they've clinched the play in berth. Well, how far out are they from avoiding the play in tournament? Uh, they, I don't think they cannot. They have to. They will be in the play in. So I, everyone in the East is eliminated. All the, the, six, so the top, so the, the, the six bottom teams. five, the bottom five are eliminated. Right. So we know the ten. But are the top six locked in that are avoiding the playoff tor- the e- playing tournament? Not all six. Well, okay. So the Bulls have thirty-seven wins. The right, you the know what? we're spending way more. We, we don't need to spend this much time. The Bulls, the my Bulls and Hawks will definitely be in the playing. They can't go. They can't go any higher. They can't low. go any higher. Yeah. Okay. They're both going to be the nine and ten seed. We, don't, we just don't know which one's going to be nine, which one's going to be ten. So you're going to have to wait this thing which out. It matters because the nine and ten play. Yeah. Th- it becomes dangerous for Kentucky because like if you only have to wait it out through the playing tournament. Then you know, no big deal. That'll be over by what next weekend. <laughs> if you have to wait it is. out, if you have to wait it out much longer than that, then you know, like imagine if they win the playing tournament. Yeah, there's no drama. Both the the bottom five of each conference are completely eliminated. So we know the ten teams that will be. Okay, I don't. In you, each, I'm, conference. I'm sorry. I don't apologize to me. I'm the conference okay. semifinals okay. is the first time that you can get me to care. <laughs> The Suns lost to the Clippers the other night. They scored, I think they were down like 29 to 4. Well, LeBron will be in the play in. Like, LeBron and Steph Curry will be in the play in. That will not get me to watch. No, I bet it will. No, it will not. Suns most likely will be in the play in. Oh, the the Suns are are a money laundering scheme, too, (laughs) dog. I'm out on the Suns. Like, I'm still there, my team. And if they start naming teams, are they money? Orlando Magic, what are they? (sighs) They teeter on money laundering scheme. Now, I get it. They've come around a little bit, and like, they're starting to look like they might be a real thing and really trying. But how long did they just spin wheels where it was like, <laughs> they could get up to the three seed. L- look at this draft pick that might be a thing, and they none of them were ever a thing, and they, they never really made the push to try to, to be relevant. Like, they existed to exist for a very long – post Shaq and Penny, they had the one year with Dwight Howard where, like, they obviously made a trip to the finals and Hato Turkoglu, and that worked out a little bit well. But for the most part, I mean, come on, dog. They have been spinning wheels and existing for the sake of you're down here because your kid's playing in a softball tournament at the Disney complex. Come to a basketball game while you're here. Like, that's the existence of the Orlando Magic for the better part of the last 30 years. So mean to the Magic. Dude. I mean, tell me I'm wrong. Now, I get it. They have a nice nucleus now. Like, they have put something together together. That appears to be real. I refuse to like actually give it credit because it would involve me giving credit to Paolo Bancaro and F that guy he went to Duke. But like I get it. They put together a nice nucleus and they look like they are coming around and finally being a thing. I acknowledge that at the start of this question. Give me another team. Um, let's go with the uh, the Indiana Pacers. Magic ahead of the well, actually they're tied. They're both they the, have the same record right now. The crazy thing about the Pacers is they've genuinely tried. They have. Like they really, I don't think I could call they them. A, put, I, I don't think, they think have exciting ba- basketball. Teams. I don't think I could call the Pacers a money laundering scheme. I think they've really given their best. Like, like they, they were the only team that could compete with LeBron for what three or four well, years. They, they like the Paul George thing worked. Yeah. Victor Oladipo for a minute looked like a star, and then he got hurt. And you know, obviously Tyrese Halliburton is really exciting, right? Like they have more consistently tried to be a thing and tried to tap into the deep love of basketball in Indiana. Um, so I, I can't I can't call them. It hasn't been fruitful necessarily, but I can't just say that they've existed to exist. I can't call them a money laundering scheme. The New Orleans Pelicans. Ugh. 
I, Guess what place they're in? Uh, oh, they've they've risen, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're they're yeah. they're like fifth, right? They uh they are sixth. sixth. They're sixth. They're three. I think they're locked into six. Actually, well, actually, they could fall into the the, the the Suns at seven right now could catch them and get themselves out of the play. Hooray! <laughs> um. The Pelicans are tough, right? Because there's not enough history there to really know exactly what the Pelicans are. Um, like, basically, I no, I can't say money laundering scheme because there's not enough for me to fall back on where they were just spinning wheels. I, I think they wanted, they badly thought that Zion Williamson was a, a franchise changer. Like, they really believed that he was going to change the course of their franchise. That hasn't been the case. Clearly, they thought that, um, you know, oh God, why am I blanking on Brandon Ingram? No, know. before Zion. Uh, like, go back to uh, 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 Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, Davis, Jesus. Oh, Anthony Davis. Holy crap! The hell just happened? Yeah, Maybe Anthony I'm a Davis. money laundering scheme. Like, they clearly thought these guys were going to be, you know, game changers, and I think they had every right to believe that. And for moments, you know, like you, you have kind of believed it. No, I can't say money laundering scheme for New Orleans. Minnesota Timberwolves. Well, not at the moment. <laughs> Jesus. You sure as hell can't say it today. I, I think post-Kevin Garnett, there was an argument that they had been. Does a, anyone believe that they're going to? No, no one believes yeah. it, but you can't ignore it. You can't pretend like it's not happening. Like, it's it's a tricky thing. I can't believe you did this. You're cutting into my oh, yeah, your you time for, talking about basketball. For, for fighting words. No reason to talk not, about basketball right now. Not able. I, if you had asked me this question in the last couple of years, yes, they would have been a money laundering scheme. But at the moment... Like you gotta buy into like Edwards and Carl Anthony Towns as being a pretty damn good nucleus. It's just that because they haven't done anything in the postseason yet, we're like we're still envisioning Patrick Beverly like running around and celebrating like a moron. Like that's still the thought that we have about the Minnesota Timberwolves. So I can't shake that just yet, but I can't call them a money launder. It's a moron. It was a legit win. It's a moron. It's a big win. And he seems like a great look what guy. It did, look what it did. Now they're like, you know yeah. That the was the moment. The you think that was the moment that everything yeah. turned? So what are the Lakers then? You know, you could make an argument that they're a money laundering scheme, but it's a different type of money laundering scheme. Like it's the type where, like they, they, it's the it's like that Los Angeles version of a money laundering scheme. Like all we're doing is laundering money, but we have to be super relevant as we do it. No, they're not a money laundering scheme. Like you can't say that. Give me one more. Um, the what are the Miami Heat? No, the Miami Heat have been incredibly relevant. They're what are you talking seed about? Right now. Yeah, I get it, but they were the eight seed a year ago and yeah. made the NBA Finals. Like, you can't. So for God's sake, the NBA doesn't matter. We. No, I think it's about the way that you go about doing your. Like the the Washington Wizards are a money laundering scheme. They are utterly and completely irrelevant. They exist for the sake of if you're a government worker or if you're somebody who's in town visiting, then maybe you'll want to come watch the opposing player play. They, they, there's, there's no connection with the city. There's no fan base. There's no nothing. The city they exist. In, uh... They exist for the sake of exist. Well, they tried to get out. <laughs> they exist for the sake of existing. They are not. They have. When was the last time the Washington Wizards tried to do something? Ever in their history? John Wall. I, I, yeah, if you want to say the combination of John Wall, Bradley Beal, they thought might be a thing. Well, like maybe. A maybe for a minute. I think they made a conference semis, the, right? the Washington Wizards are the definition of a money, of a money laundering scheme. They they exist for the sake of existence. I think, unfortunately, the Portland Trailblazers would have to fall into that conversation. I get it that for moments they've looked a bit more relevant than that. Like, they've, mm, it's been fleeting. Yeah. That Like, for moments you were like, hey, Damian Lillard, though. But they never, it was more like they stumbled into that. And that they had a determined plan to be more than a money laundering scheme. I think for the modern history, the Portland Trailblazers are an organization that has existed for the sake of existing. Yeah, they made uh, the first season with Scott Brooks. They made uh, they were the four seed. Okay, God bless them. They lost to the Celtics. They forced a game seven with the money Celtics in the conference. Launder- uh, was that the, was that when um, what's his face played for the Wizards? Was that Paul Pierce? He was that Paul. I think that was that had to be right. God, God. Anyway, all right, we've done enough of this. Go ahead, hit the music. Uh, okay, well, it's Fighting Words with Rippin' Bats. Fighting Words brought to you by the Stan the Fan Variety Hour, because when you think fighting, you think Stan the Fan. Stan Ross and Luke every Monday. Stan and Eric Garfield every Thursday. Facebook.com slash Pressbox Sports. If you miss it live, YouTube.com slash Pressbox Online or Pressboxonline.com slash video. All right, pal. 
Um, it is, uh, of course, everyone is excited. It's week two of PFL tomorrow night. Patricky get Pitbull. To the, just get to the part. Makes We're not, PFL we do game. not have enough time for you to, doing, to, to be doing shit. <sighs> All right. Uh, it's, uh, it is, it's a really incredible card. So, I mean, as Glenn brought up, you know, it, there's no, you know, next e echelon, you know, superstar on this card that, you know, makes everyone have to stop what they're doing and, and go see Connor or John Jones or, or whoever. Um, but I feel like they, I feel like the UFC is somewhat you know maybe they kind of learned like they like Connor and John Jones was what they were building for UFC like 200 and they both you know end up falling like they, they, they I think they're realizing they, they stack this card with fights that all of these guys are you know very very professional professionals and this card's been pretty much locked in for the last like six to eight weeks like no one like we have not I guess I should knock on wood you know no one has like fallen out no one mm. has mm. has gotten sick or gotten injured and it's and you know it has stayed intact for like over the for, for over the over the, the past month almost two months now um and you know it's just it's just every single fight could be here rank them give me, give me okay, your top rank. we'll do four okay. or five no you can go five give me rank your top you can go from one to five if you well, want Bo Nichols number one so, but it's not just person. I mean, the fights, the actual. Bo Nickel versus fights. Cody Brundage. Uh, I mean, once again, he is a minus. It was, I think it was a minus twenty five hundred. I think it might be up to three thousand now. Yeah. Yeah. So on FanDuel right now, it is minus three thousand for Bo Nickel. Uh, yeah, he will once again get another uh, first round finish. Cody Brundage is. And it doesn't seem like as a food. fight, it's that great of a fight. Well, it's Co it's Bo Nickel, and you need. No, no, to th see. you're not listening to me. Rank the fights. Charles Oliveira, Armin Sarukian is a fantastic. All right, hold on. I gotta. All right, all right fight number one. Max Holloway, Justin Gagey. This is the this is the BMF. You know the, the fight. It, you know you say what Which, you want. It's a gimmick, whatever. That's but, not a thing. But but yeah. we but it, what it did get us is Max Holloway versus Justin Gagey. These are the two most exciting fighters in the history of the UFC. Every time that they fight, they put on. It becomes a, it becomes a war. It becomes a classic. It becomes the fight of the night without a doubt. Um, so I I mean I I have no idea how this is gonna go because Max Holloway is a 145er. He's fought most of his career at 145. Um, Gaethje is a 155er, lightweight, and uh, and he has he has been the lightweight champ. Holloway's been the featherweight champ. Fe Holloway, the only person that's beaten Holloway in the last like five years is Alexander Volkanovski. He's beaten him three times. That's the only guy right. that can beat him. Um, so this seems like you know kind of kind of makes sense. Of course, uh, Volkanovski lost in, in February to Ilya Zaporia. Um, so kind of so he could he could probably in theory go back to 145 now and have a chance to get the belt back. But I mean this is this is just gonna be it's gonna be an incredible fight. We get five rounds of it. I think it's gonna be I I mean I I really have almost no lean right now. I think the odds slightly favor uh, slightly favor Justin Gagey. Oh he's down to minus 178 now. That makes me kind of like Holloway a little bit more. Okay. Uh, I think right. it I because I I think it's gonna go to the decision. Holloway right. doesn't get finished. Right. Ever. We, gotta, we gotta pick up the pace. That is number one, Holloway Gagey. I am very excited about, I said Charles Oliveira, Armin Sarukian. I like Charles Oliveira a lot in this one. He He's a big underdog as well. I say big. He's plus 175 as an underdog right now over Armin Sarukian. It makes no sense. Uh, Bo Nickel, I think it's the most shocking line on the card. Bo Nickel is a minus 3,000 favorite. This is the most shocking line on the card. Charles Oliveira has been the lightweight champ for the last, in, uh, you know, up until Islam took over. And he has one loss in the last six years. That's to Islam Makachev. And this guy Armin Sarukian is kind of just he, he I, I have not been impressed by him. Uh, I mean he he got a he got a very quick like 90 second knockout over Benil Dariush, and that was Dariush's fight right after getting knocked out by Charles Oliveira. So maybe you know Charles Oliveira you know he, he loosened him up a little bit so that Sarukian could give, could, could could knock him out. Sarukian's got legit knockout power, um, and he he's you know he's he's certainly a name in 155 in the lightweight division. Um, but I just I don't the line doesn't make any sense to me. I can't see how Charles Oliveira, you know, I, I think he has the advantage everywhere. He's got a reach, a height advantage, the experience advantage. Um, like it, it just doesn't like o Oliveira went through like sarukian has got power. I think that's the scary part about Sarukian, But like that has not given him a challenge of recent. He ran through the heaviest hitters in the vi in the division in order in Dustin Poirier, in Michael Chandler, in. Uh, in uh, in, in Justin Ga in Justin Gagey and uh, and you can add Tony Ferguson to that too before Tony Ferguson completely fell off. Uh, like it's been this time last year, Sarukian was in between a decision win over some guy named Demir Ismagulov and a knockout of some other guy named Joachim uh, jo Silva. Mm. Like and that was and, was, and that was <laughs> thank you and that was off they're coming off of a very disappointing loss against Matus Gamrot uh, in a in a decision where he just kind of just fell apart in the in the in the later rounds and, and Gamrot. I, I, 
some people were a little uh, upset about the decision. I, I Gamrot definitely won that won that fight. He gassed out late. Sarukian did. So I like Charles Oliveira. There's a lot of value in plus 175 right now. I like Charles Oliveira a lot over Armin Sarukian. And then the other two that I like a lot uh, outside of the, the top title fight, and I, I'll go uh, Aljamain Sterling and Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater is one of my favorite fighters. This is a prelim. This is this one that will be on prelim. ESPN. Yes, this will be around... Uh, probably about a little after 9 o'clock, I would think, um, on the on ESPN. I believe the, all the prelims are on ESPN. So Aljamain Sterling obviously is, was the longtime bantamweight champion and just got knocked out by Sean O'Malley last August. And I think he's going to be he's, – so he's moving up to 145 for this. Um, and I think he's going to stay here. He, he looks really good in some of the pictures that we've seen of him uh, in, in, in his training. So he, he looks really good. I'm kind of disappointed because I love Calvin Cater so much. But the last time we saw Calvin Cater was two year, uh, it, was, it was 18 months ago. And it was when he tore his knee in this fight against Arnold Allen where he did this, like, dumb spinning, jumping kick, and it just landed on his knee wrong. It was really disappointing. Um, so this will be his first fight back since that. And 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 Aljo is, you know, he's, he's making room for Marab essentially at 135, his his good buddy Marab to be really, to essentially knock off Sean O'Malley at some point. Um, and I think Aljo's going to stay here. I think Cater will – I think the way this fight's going to go is that Cater's going to look good for the first round. And, um, you know, I, it, but it's hard for me to trust him past that, you know, with coming off of the knee injury. And I think Aljo's just going to take over and, and really settle in later in okay. and, and land some take, like get, get the timing on his takedowns down and sub. Eh. Cater's Cal- been subbed once in his career. I think it was the f- what it, like his first career fight or something. One of his first few career fights back in 2008. So I think Aljo's going to grind this one out and get it and get a decision in what should be a really nice fight i'm excited for this one so i think aljamain sterling at minus 170 i'll get the odds on or he's minus 180 now aljo to win a decision is plus 130 i like that i like aljo to get a decision over over calvin cater i'm gonna have to skip over i guess yuri prohaska uh he's because i love yuri prohaska he was the he beat glover Teixeira a couple years back and for the light heavyweight belt then he tore his shoulder i believe or tore his pec actually um, so he was out for a while, and then he lost to Alex Pajera, and that is the headliner, Alex Pajera and Jamal Hill. Um, I I think uh, I think Alex Pajera wins this one. I, it's uh it's it's hard to it's hard to go against him right now. Uh, you can, I think Jamal Hill's really only way is is if he kind of slows this down, grinds it out, and he's not no Jamal Hill is not known for his wrestling, but he's got a good he's got good wrestling. But I don't think uh, no one's shown that they can slow down. Alex Pereira uh, on, on, with, with with wrestling. He Jan, Jan Blahovich uh, was a big light heavyweight guy that that has good wrestling, and you know Pereira was on his back at times against Jan Blahovich, and he grinded that out to get a win. So I think Pereira uh, will will. I mean, he's got the, the some of the greatest power that we've ever seen in UFC. So I think he's either going to catch Jamal Hill the later this fight goes on, um, or, or or you know he'll do enough on his feet to and 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 not let Jamal Hill do enough on the ground that I, I think he gets a decision or a knockout. So I like them a lot. Kayla Harrison's fighting on this card as well. She will be making her UFC debut, a longtime PFL, yep. uh, a judo uh, Olympic med- gold medalist. Um, so that one's next. Like the interesting thing about so she's fighting Holly Holm. She's a big favorite as well. Is Holly she's, Holm like fifty now. She is forty two. Yeah. So she's a big favorite over Holly Holm. The interesting part, so they're fighting at 135. At in the PFL, Kayla Harrison was fighting at 155. Huh. So she has huh. to drop a lot. She okay. was at, in in judo. She was like at around like 170, I think, during her time in the Olympics. So she is dropped. Uh, she's dropping a lot of weight. Um, I don't think it's gonna matter because Kayla's just she's she's younger. She's 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 done. She, she she's better everywhere. She's stronger. She's more powerful, and she has a submission game. And and she was one of practical jokers too. She did. Wow, uh, she, well that's very important. So yes. I, so she's pretty much a lock for that for that reason. I think that one's going to go to decision. Um, I have to check the odds on that, but I think there would. I want to see if there's any more if it adds any value, because she's minus four sixty right now. So Kayla Harrison to oh Kayla Harrison by points as well plus one thirty. Mm. I like that one a lot mm. as well. Okay. Um, the parlay that right. I like here. Yeah, quick oh, man. I can't. I didn't even have time to go over. Davis and Figueredo and Cody Garbrandt is the ah. is this is the opening bout on the card. Man, I mean, these are two former champions. Okay, we we got to do the do the parlay. All right, do Figueredo quickly. is minus three twenty. Kayla Harrison just money line. We're going and then Zhang Wei Li uh, over Yan Zhao Nan in the women's strawweight title, which is right before Alex Pajeda. Uh, and that is minus 110 if you put all three of them together. So okay. I feel very 
confident in that parlor. Chance yeah. to make some money that way. And Sadiq Youssef is also yes, on this card. Sadiq Youssef is on the card. Jim Miller will be fighting yeah, on this card. Man, that's that's kind of a gimmick. But Sadiq Youssef, of course. Jim Miller's uh, got a legitimate chance. That's fine, but come on, He's man. fought on UFC 100, yes. 200, and 300. Maybe, so, hopefully nothing bad happens to this card and we don't have to call Brock Lesnar and he becomes, uh, you know, oy, oy. another don't fighter that's fought on not, 100, 200, and 300. Not, let's not do that. Um, I yeah, do S- not. Sadiq Youssef, for those that don't know, is uh, trains out of Maryland. He's been a he's a former guest on the show mm-hmm. and a uh, good guy. And he's also found a little um, pop culture uh, relevancy because he's what's the show that he's a voice on? Oh, uh, uh, it's a Disney Plus show. I don't want to. I don't remember what wrong. it's. I don't remember yeah. what it's called. But he's he's a he's a voice on an animated a show. A Waju. Yes, and on so Disney Plus. It's a very good show. He's gotten yeah. a little bit of attention for that. I unfortunately don't like his chances. This is a All bad right. matchup with him like for, right. uh, against Diego Lo- Lopez. All right. Appreciate that, Griffin. I know we had to keep we had to keep you to only 10 minutes, and that was very heartbreaking for you. But we do still pe- want people to listen to the show, and not everybody actually cares about this. So it is what it is. Yes, UFC 300 on uh, Saturday night. And the place to watch it is inside Sports and Social at Live Casino and Hotel Maryland. Make your uh, reservations to get a table still on the uh, website. Go to Live Casino's website and then click on Sports and Social, and you can make your reservation that way. And you can also reserve the uh, the reclining blue seats by going to the physical FanDuel Sportsbook at Live Casino and Hotel and get those spots reserved. I think they still have a couple available for Saturday night and UFC 300. Also, you can just hang out and watch the Masters. Everything else going on this weekend, but they'll be showing UFC 300 on Saturday night. All right, hour number two continues here on GCR, and it's time on Thursdays we make a trip to Bowie to chat with a member of the Bay Sox. Our next guest off to a solid start in the 2024 season. He is Bay Sox infielder Colin Burns, and he's with us now here on GCR. Colin, it's Glenn in Baltimore. It's great to chat, man. Thank you for taking the time for us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, man. Colin, by the way, for someone from Louisiana, you sound the least like someone from Louisiana that I've ever talked to. Like, yeah. where, 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 yeah. is, where no, is all the no Cajun, Cajun in your voice? Right? <laughs> were, were you, yeah, there's no Cajun accent in me. Growing up, Some of my family members. Okay. Have have that accent, but not me. We're, growing up, were you the weirdo? Where did everybody look at you like, boy, you talk weird. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how it went. <laughs> that's really funny. Colin, remind me because I I don't remember what the story was last year. Um, because I know you didn't play in that many games. What what was going on with last year? Yeah, I was just uh, dealing with a slew of injuries. Um, I hurt my hand in spring training. Um, that took. Um, essentially pretty much all year to to really rehab and it didn't get to a hundred percent until this off season. Um another injury that popped up while I was um finally got to buoy last year after rehabbing my hand, um a meniscus injury and I ended up having to get surgery this off season. The difficulty of going through all of that as you're trying, you know, like everybody talks about how you make double A for so many guys when they say it starts to get real, right? Like now you're on the cusp, you know you're on the radar, you know the opportunity is there, and and you want to be able to adjust to this higher level of facing guys that are legitimate major leaguers. How difficult was it for you going through all of that as you were trying to make the adjustment a year ago? I would say it's, it's very important to stay healthy and and now more than ever I understand that after going through all those injuries last year um sometimes it's just it's just luck you know but there's also things that that I know that are in my control that that if I I stick to you know like hydration making sure that I'm Mm. I'm on point with that and and nutrition and my warm-up and and if I take care of all that stuff um, you know, hopefully uh, I can stay healthy. Colin, the I, I talk about the adjustment, right? Like I know it was only a few games for you last year that you were actually able to play, and it's only been a, in a few this year. But how much have you felt that, that like just the difference even from high A to double A, how real that is, that like you're you're mostly facing guys that will have a shot to be big league pitchers now? Yeah. Yeah, no, I can definitely tell 
um, it's a jump up and, and I, I've always loved the challenge. Um, this is a level that's definitely going to challenge me to prepare me, um, for, for the levels to come and hopefully the big leagues. And so, uh, this is great. It's, it's a great opportunity to get better here in Bowie. Colin, you, you know, your path is interesting, right? You were a higher draft pick. You were somebody that clearly, you know, the Orioles um, were interested in to a level that there was belief that you would have this path to come. Has has there been a moment yet for you where it's hit you and you've said, ah, it's real. I know I can do this. I have no doubt that I'm going to get the chance to be a big leaguer, or are you still working towards that moment at this point? I think the what I'm just trying to do is control everything in my power, um, which is to prepare well, play well, um, and then I know that the rest will come. Colin Burns is with us from the Bowie Bay Sox. We'll tell you more about what's going on with the Bay Sox here in a second. Colin, um, I, I know positionally, right, like you've been playing a lot of, a di- of different positions that – your reputation was second base, but you played an awful lot of shortstop this year, playing a little bit of third base. Yeah. It is 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 the idea either between you or the organization? Do you have the sense it's hey, you need to be playing an awful lot of positions because your path might be your versatility, or is it trying to find the one place that you still might be able to master? Yeah, no, I think I think that the the first is true i think um the vers- there's value in versatility and being able to play multiple positions and play them at a high level um you know i was drafted a shortstop i'm i feel uh very uh comfortable at shortstop um and then moving over playing some second as well uh, always been comfortable there at second and short and uh now you know in this spring training i got uh, to get a lot of reps over at third and, and adding that to, to my tool bag uh, so that, you know, if, when the coach is making a lineup, he knows that I can play third, short, and second at a high level. I think that's, that, that only adds value. So I see it as a good thing. What, what is it? Can you, can you paint me a picture of what that looks like on, on a different day? Like how much do you take, like, you know, grounders at every position? Do you find yourself trying to get every work in? <laughs> yeah, I like, do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I um, whichever whichever position I'm playing that day, I'll I'll hop over. Okay, so you kind um, of focus like on. Today I'm playing third, so so I'll be taking them at third. Yesterday I was taking them at shortstop. But you're not like every day trying to get in like you know ten minutes at each position to make sure. Oh. No. Okay. No, just whatever, whatever, whatever the day is. That uh, and that yeah. makes that makes all the sense in the world. Is it as dramatically different? You know, like we talk about this all the time. You know, obviously, you know what's going on at the highest level. So Jackson Holiday's making the jump to second, and people are like, "Wow, you know, you need." Is it as dramatically different as it feels like it is, or is it kind of just baseball, right? Like, if you know the game, you know what mm-hmm. you're supposed to do. It's not to you. It's not crazy to be playing multiple different positions within the span of a week. Yeah. No, I think I think that's very true. It, it at the end of the day, it is baseball, and it's. It's just, you know, preparing to play. Um, I see infield defense a lot like shooting free throws hmm. in basketball, you know. And so if you can get your, you know, 10 to 15 free throws before a game, uh, see it go in the net, and that's just the equivalent of, like, throwing at the different positions. And so as long as I, I get my, my early work in, um, and I'll feel confident to throw – from second, short, or third. What's it like to be in the Orioles organization right now, man? Like there, it's there's obviously so much excitement at the top. I guess that's maybe measured a little yeah. bit by the fact that, like, hey, there's not an easy path for you. That's ahead. You know, there's so much talent here. But what's it like to be a part of all of this? It's it's awesome. Um, yeah, we've got so much talent, uh, and it's great to play with great players because. Um, being around other great players just makes, makes, makes us better. And it's, it's fun to win. I will say this Bowie clubhouse, it's, uh, it's very fun. We, we're, we're all very close. Um, and, 
and you know I been around a lot of these guys since I've gotten drafted and I've gotten to know some of the um other other guys as well already uh very fun and we're gonna learn a lot from each other this year and and get better and and yeah who's very the, excited about who's, this who's the guy that th- during the years you've been the closest with like I don't know if it's you know a roommate or, or just somebody that you got yeah. to know really yeah, well yeah okay I'd say Billy Cook okay um yep. we were roommates in Aberdeen in 22 or um, are are I think I've somebody I think I remember talking. Is Bill Billy's a golfer, right? I think I've talked to him about that before. Is he? Are you a golfer? Yeah, he he golfs he golfs a little bit. What about you? <laughs> um, I'm I'm okay. So uh, okay, so then what's the go? Now like my wife is was a college golfer. Oh wow! So she she crushes me every time. So I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Okay. So, what does that lead? Does that lead to like you want to play more so you can sharpen to be able to compete against her, or like, no, I know I'm going to get my ass kicked. So why would I go out there and put myself through that? Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. Right now, I know that I'm gonna get beat by her. Yeah. <laughs> um. But I've told her by the time that I'm 50 years old, this will be you know, after baseball when I'll be able to practice every day that I'm going to beat her. Okay. <laughs> so you got a lot of time to work on that. Yeah, I have some like, time. Get, ba- yeah. get through the baseball career, and then you can spend some more time focusing. And then, like, maybe by that point, she doesn't care quite as much about it. Right. That's the, that's the plan. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> was, she, um, was she a golfer at Tulane, too? Yeah, she was. Okay, so that's cool. That's a really that's that's very neat that, that you know, I, I, that you guys were able to meet there. All right, I, I need to know um, – you know, from your time in New Orleans, so I've got all my like I I legitimately New Orleans is my favorite American city. I spend I have I've maybe made you know eight trips in the last decade. Like I just love it that deeply. But you know I go awesome. I go to all the play like I go to Dookie Chases. I go to Willie May. Like I go to you know the yeah. Quarter Two Sisters and Coops. Like Coops is my spot where I will just shove the rabbit jambalaya down my gullet. Like you know play after play. Give me the place that maybe yeah. I don't know about that on my next trip I need to check out. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I would say okay, bocce. Oh. It's not necessarily New Orleans cuisine. It's a Vietnamese spot, mm. but it's one of my favorites. Um, they have some of the best Vietnamese food I've ever eaten. Wow, wow! What's your go-to when yeah. you order Vietnamese? Like what? I I don't know how much I've had Vietnamese food in my life. Yeah, they they have uh, really good lemongrass chicken wings Ooh, ooh. uh and then also i mean new orleans is known for their po' boys of they they have really good um it's like a vietnamese style okay po boy, uh, barbecue pork po' boy that's my go-to i love it i love it i will definitely check that out on my next trip hey the yeah. bay Sox are back home next week starting on tuesday hosting the altoona curve Highlights next week include uh, a STEM Day as well as Glow in the Park next Friday night with a post-game light show. That'll be really cool. Next weekend, fireworks, uh, Negro League tribute as well, and a Meet the Team uh, event next Sunday, April 21st, with a Knit Beanie giveaway as well. You can find out more about all of these events and get your tickets at BaySox.com. Colin, um, I really appreciate you taking the time for us this morning. Can't wait to see what's next for you. Thank you for doing this, man. Continued success this season, all right? Thanks. Appreciate it. It's Colin Burns from the Bowie Bay Sox with us here on GCR. Appreciate him taking the time for us on a Thursday edition of the program. Already has seven RBI on the uh, short season, so appreciate him taking the time for us. We continue along. Today's show also brought to you by Goose Flights, available all over town. Goose Flights, not only a delicious lager, but also goes to benefit a great cause. As one ninety eight from every can sold goes to the Goose Flights Foundation and the work they're doing to provide non-emergency medical transport for those in need to continue the legacy of the great Tony Siragusa. Pressboxonline.com slash Goose Flights. That's how you find out more about where you can find Goose Flights throughout the Baltimore region. NFL Draft just two weeks away, and our next guest is definitely going to hear his name called early on during the course of the draft. He is a Maryland native. He is a Terp and was a hell of a lot of fun to watch play. He is Bo Braid, and he is with us now here on GCR. 
Bo, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you for taking the time for us this morning. Well, and thanks for having me. Hey, man, it's it's great to hear from you. I'm so excited for you. Dude, there's so much I want to cover with you. I, I just wanted to start because it, it, it was really cool for me that guys like you that already knew you're going to be drafted and it's time to get ready for this, but you decided that you – wanted to be on the field and you didn't want to opt out of the bowl game and you wanted to be a part of that with the guys why and 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 can you walk me through what it meant to you to be able to deliver that type of win over that type of program to wrap up your college career yeah of course so um part of, when my decision was really just being there for my guys you know that's you know when i look back at maryland that's probably the number one thing that i'm going to keep thinking about just my time with my teammates and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I feel like I was part of a, a, a part of a class that really built that foundation that Maryland's going to have in the future with those three bowl, bowl game wins. And, um, you know, I just make sure that every time I get out there and play that I play for them. So I didn't want to, you know, opt out and, you know, off a potential uh, injury, you know, I definitely got insurance, you know, for the game. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't want to opt out. You know, I want to be there for my guys. And, you know, playing against Auburn, I think SEC is cool. Um, but, the, you know, their history. So, I mean, just want to play in the game, you know. Uh, dude, I love that, man. I, I, you know, I, it was so cool to see and how much it meant to everybody and the way that you guys were rallying around each other. It was just a special thing. And and I know that, like, you know, everything that you're going to accomplish moving forward, I, I guess what is it meant to you? You mentioned the three bowl wins. Like, that being part and a significant part of the group that got Maryland football turned around from, you know, where it was when you arrived, like you knew it was a, it was a trying time that Maryland was coming out of. What will it mean to you in 20, 30 years to be able to say, I played a major role as a kid from here in getting this thing turned around? It's going to mean a lot. It's going to mean a lot. You know, I'm really excited to see what, uh, what do they do next, next season? And uh, in this new, you know, Big Ten conference with all the different uh, teams they play, you know, going to even the West Coast for some games. But um, it, it's going to mean a lot, you know. It's going to mean a lot for my guys on that, too. And, you know, talking about the bowl games, I mean, those that's been some of the best experiences I've had at Maryland. That's cool. Um, you know, from Virginia Tech game to NC State game until this last Auburn game, I mean, um, my, my favorite play, my favorite uh, part, or moment of being a Terp, I think, was that Glenn Miller pick six. Mm. Um, mm. And, I mean, I had nothing to do with it. Um, mm. I definitely put that play over any of the picks I've had or any tackles I've had as my number one moment um, as being a football player in Maryland. Because, I mean, that's when you see all the team with the fun, they're having the joy. You know, everyone's, um, you know, having just a good time and uh, playing for each other. So, I mean, it's it's been a great experience. I can't wait to see what – Terps doing the future and um how Loxley continues to build that's awesome man he is Howard County his own Bo Braid and he is with us here on GCR Bo I I in watching you and it's a it's a lofty comparison right because you know what Kyle Hamilton has done since he's arrived here in Baltimore like he's been an utter and complete game changer and just a star of stars but I I, it was funny because last year I started paying more attention to the way that you played and we've always seen you make the big hits, but I don't think I had thought about the like playing at different levels. How much do you feel like you can be that type of weapon for a defense that like you can't just put into one, hey, this is the one thing that I do, that you have the ability to maybe help literally on every level of a defense at the pro level? Um, I think I think there's no there's no uh thought in my mind that thinks I can't do that or I can't be that. Um, and that just comes with the work, you know. I feel like the work I've put in will um, allow me to play at that type of level. So, I mean, I see what he does. I kind of, you know, kind of building the defense around him. He gets to cover, blitz, you know, make big plays. And he's a playmaker. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's just him. But, I mean, I love to see it, you know, come into Maryland. And my first couple of years, I was that hard hitter, as you as you brought up. And um, over the past couple of years, I've been trying to just make a, you know, Instead of being a big hitter, I want to be a big playmaker. Yeah. Whether that's you know, forcing turnovers through a interception or a punch out fumble, and um, you know th- those really those are plays that switch games. Those are plays that allow you to you know win games and make championships. So, uh, you know that's what I practice and that's why you know 
love to do. But I can't imagine that, like, the love for hitting goes away, right? Like, you, dude, I, I've seen the hits that you've leveled. Like, there's got to be a part of you that just, you know, it, it, it's it, there's got to be, like, a joy that comes from that type of thing, right? Yeah, most most definitely. And that's been since I've been a little kid. I mean, I've been hitting like that. But, um, you know, especially with the new day and age with football. Yeah, no doubt. Hit, you know, sometimes when you see a receiver going across the middle, you can't blow him up as he used to. So, I mean, um, still, you know, I still like to um, unleash the beast, as my mom says it, uh, <laughs> whenever I can, you know, without uh, being possible to get a flag or a penalty. But, you know, some of those those bigger hits, I got to – I got to shy away from him, get the guy on the ground, you know. Where does that come from? But, like, you know, it's it's funny. You may un- unleash the beast, right? Like, we've talked to you a few times. You're, you're, you're a really nice guy. We hear you on the podcast. Like, we, we yeah. know your personality. I- is it almost like you, you like a professional wrestling thing? Like, you become a different person when you step on a football field? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I, fl- uh, I switched the flips, and um, it's, it just, I don't know. It happens the same way in practice on the game. When I ever touch that field, it's just you know, just like that. I'm I'm in that mood. I'm in that mode. So um, I don't, I don't know what it is. I think it's I don't know what it is. I can't I can't <laughs> couldn't tell you. Do you know where it comes from? Like, do you remember like the first? Because you say it comes from a young age. Was what was there somebody in your life that like that would hype you up, or do you like remember where it all came from that you became such a I, you know, a, a physical and, and, and specifically related to football, like became just this different type of personality. Yeah. So my work ethic came from both my parents. Most okay. Personally, and I think the strain to that, you know, full the, the most I could comes from them, but, you know, also, you know, growing up watching Ed Reed, and Ray Lewis and right. Terrell Suggs and those guys. That's, that's, I feel like that definitely plays a role in that too. Yeah, let's let's so. let's get to that part of this, right? Bo Bray is with us here on GCR. I, I I know how this goes. You're about to have a favorite football team, and it was always that team, and that's the way that that's the way it is. But, mm-hmm. dude, have you allowed yourself to think, like even for a second, what it would mean to you if it were to be the Ravens? Like, do you let your mind go there at all? Um, not quite. I don't, I don't, I let it, I let, I think about it a little bit and but I'm like, oh, like that will be cool. But anything more than that, I don't do because I don't try to, you know, yeah. get into that mind. I'm going to write half on the field. And I get but, it. Um, You're going to be happy if it's the Seahawks. You're going to be happy if it's, you know, the, the, the Lions. I understand all of that. But, but no what would it mean, right? Like how, how much maybe even more significant would it be if it played out that way for you? Um, at this point, it's like I'm I'm happy with any opportunity, as you know. But um, I feel like it's more playing in front of you know my family and yeah. friends that I grew up with every week. That would be sort of type of thing. So anytime I would touch M and T Bank uh, Stadium, uh, the field, whether I'm a Raven or you know playing against the Ravens, it's going to be a big game for me, no doubt. Yeah, we're going to have a problem if it's the other way. We're going to have a problem <laughs> if it's Pittsburgh or something like that. So is, I just want to make sure, was it always Ravens for you growing up and not Commanders or, you know, whatever, you know, Redskins, whatever it was at the time? Yeah, it was always Ravens. Yeah. It was always Ravens. What, what, who, yeah. you, you mentioned, obviously, the stars of stars, but, like, dude, you were really young when Ray Lewis and Ed Reed were running around. Um, yeah. who Who all were your guys? Like, who were the guys that you looked up to? And and were there specifically? Was it you know Ed? Were there guys that you said I want to play like that? That's the type of player that I want to be. Yes, I mean growing up, I used to just watch Ray Lewis. You know, watch the YouTube videos, his hits, his motivational videos. Wow. Um, you know his cards, uh, trick with the push-ups, and you know that's <laughs> I feel like that's really where I got a lot of my uh, hitting from when I see him do it. I was like, oh, I, I want to do that. I didn't really, you know, watch too much Ed Reed growing up, which is surprising because I'm a safety now. Right. But uh, uh, I didn't play safety until I was in high school. And then I was like, okay, yeah, let me check out more Ed Reed highlights, trying to get like that. But um, <laughs> it's definitely a uh, Ray Lewis growing up, I would say. Do you do you uh, have? Can you do like a Ray Lewis impression? Like, can you, would, would, could you be called into the the? the were, you, were you the guy that was delivering those types of speeches? Some sometimes, sometimes in a little league, yes, in high school sometimes and then in college sometimes i'd have to you know it have to be a certain uh, i have a feeling i had pre-game to really do it but usually i'm just you know with myself i'm you know psyched up with by myself and ready to go 
does it does it bother you, Bo? Like the, that you are not, you know. Look, man, I know that you're not going to worry too much about this stuff, but the internet exists, right? Does it bother you that you're not listed at the top of the safety rankings? Like, despite everything you put on film, despite all the talent we know you have, and and maybe does it help that like you're a guy that maybe has you know, like you you come from a, a public school, like you don't come from a place where everything has been given to you. Does that help you as you make this jump, knowing you still have things you're going to have to prove? You know, Glenn. You know, sometimes it it does. You know, suck. I'm like, come, like, look at the tape. Look right. The tape. Right. But as as the end of the day, I I know what I can do. I'm at this point. I'm like, no matter where I do get drafted, I'm gonna ball out wherever I go. And um, I mean, maybe it's just gonna give me a little more edge. You know, if yeah. I see a couple more names go before I come, but it, it'll. I'm 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 happy with where I'm at, and. uh I can't wait. Do, do you feel like I, I mentioned coming from a public school, right? Like, I, it's not like there haven't been other guys that have come from public schools that have had success. But d- does that help? Does that help in like the hey, I've always had to prove it. Like, I, nothing has been given to me, and that will translate for you as you make this jump, where you're gonna maybe your your work ethic and your mentality might be different than someone that perhaps has always been at the top of every list and hasn't had to like you know, work harder in order to get that attention. Yeah, most most definitely. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to be from, even though public school, I went, I'm from Howard County. I went to River Hill High School. So I'm fortunate in that aspect from, uh, you know, academic-wise. But um, I definitely, you know, always on football field, people overlook you, you know, go, come from public school. And then um, sometimes at this point, you know, going to, a, um, going to Maryland compared, compared to like Georgia or, Alabama or in those powerhouse schools, but um, that I I love it. I love it. You know, if you underestimate me, then you know, perfect because I'm gonna prove you wrong every time. That's how my mind works. So I mean, I'm I'm cool. I'm cool with it. Um, I always had to prove myself, and I mean, I'm gonna work my butt off no matter what, and uh, till I prove not just to everyone else, but to myself that you know, I'm I'm the best I can be. Love it. I love that, man. All right, so so tell me about I. You know, I think we've talked about the podcast before. I thought it was really cool. Mm-hmm. You, Dante, Ruben Hippolyte, getting together for the One Speed podcast. Why was that something that you wanted to do? And and is is it something that you guys are like hell bent? We're going to keep doing this thing moving forward. It's... Right. So it was something we you know kept uh, thinking about, and we were just kind of playing around with. And then one day we just you know did it. And we feel like athletes are really, you know, find a hobby outside of their sport and something they could uh, uh, do on on their spare time other than their sport and uh, school. And so that's what we were trying to do. And so last summer we had our, you know, backpack drive where we raised over $10,000 to get 200 Under under Armour backpacks for an elementary school nearby. And so making it, being able to make an impact like that on, you know, the community and kids around you is just, that's, that's the point of all of this. So I mean, the podcast has been great. We've created other content where we. Well, I, like I saw you, other- you did like a video, uh, like competing with the women's basketball team. Yep, yes, that's sir. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. dude, that's a ten. Soccer, gymnastics. So, but we like to integrate all of the, you know, all the terps together as a uh, one family. But um, yeah. So we look to keep doing it in the future. Um, it'll be you know a little a little harder to do, as uh, all of us aren't under the same sure. roof you know, area, but um, we're looking to keep it, continue it. And, you know, one speed entertainment, one speed podcast, and one speed just means to whatever you're doing, try it to the fullest of your ability without any uh, second guesses or regard of consequence. And you can find it on YouTube and on Twitter at one speed podcast and on Instagram as well. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, but I, I, you know, look, man, I, I really enjoyed watching you play football and I've really enjoyed our conversations. I know how good you are and I can't wait to see what you're going to bring. Y- you know, this is going to be awkward, though, because like we we badly want it to be here. If it, <laughs> if it ends up being like and there's been an awful lot, you know, I know that like Dino was here for a minute. It feels like there was like a Maryland, you know, Matt Canada was there. Like it feels like there's uh-huh. been a Maryland Pittsburgh thing over the last couple of years. If it ends up being that way, it's going to be really uncomfortable for us, bro. Yeah, like, <laughs> we'll, we'll be happy for you, but, like, you're just going to have to understand that anything we say moving forward is not personal, right? Like, yeah. 
that's the way it's going to be. Um, at, I know it's at BEBraid02 on Twitter. Um, what about on Instagram? Where can everybody be giving you a follow, Bo? Instagram is Bo Braid, B E A U B R A D E. Dude, I have truly enjoyed watching you play these last few years, man. Like, it's been awesome. And, and you're, as a local kid, we will root for you for forever. And we can't wait to see how this plays out. And you know, we'll be in touch and we'll be following you. Bo, thank you for taking the time for us. Best of luck as this thing gets underway. I appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. That's Bo Braid, uh, former Terp, and now getting ready for the NFL draft. And, and seriously, a guy, it, the guy's a hell of a football player. We talked about it with Joe Serpico earlier. I don't, I don't want to say he's Kyle Hamilton because, like, you know, God, Kyle Hamilton has separated himself. But that modern concept of what a weapon can be defensively, and, and as he pointed out, being a playmaker. I'm not just a hitter. I'm a playmaker. He is a hitter. But now it's doing everything I can to make an impact defensively that can't be pigeonholed into a box. That's what Bo Braid has had to offer during the course of his career at the University of Maryland. And I, I, he is a really intriguing prospect beyond just the fact that he's a local kid and he's from River Hill. And, you know, it'd be an awesome story to see him end up sticking around here in Baltimore. But beyond that, damn good football player and someone that is a very intriguing name going into the NFL draft. Thank you to Bo Braid for spending the time with us this morning. All right. Today's show uh, also brought to you by the print issue of PressBox. Final days, like literally the final days that you can go pick up this print issue of PressBox before it is gone for good. So go get it now and then forever hold your peace. Coming next week, new print issue of PressBox with Grayson Rodriguez on the cover. You'll want to pick that up at your neighborhood Royal Farms. When we come back in, we'll get a tidbit and tubit or wind things down for a Thursday edition of GCR. Hartford Community College will host the National Junior College Athletic Association's 2024 Men's Lacrosse National Championship and Women's Lacrosse Invitational on May 11th and 12th at Hartford Sports Complex, 401 Thomas Run Road in Bel Air, Maryland. The semifinals on May 11th include the Women's Invitational with the Women's North A representative playing the Mid-Atlantic B representative at 10 a.m. and the Women's North B representative facing off against the Mid-Atlantic A representative at 12.30 p.m. For the men's championship, the number one seed will play the lowest remaining seed in the quarterfinal round at 3.30 p.m. The men's number two seed will face off against the highest remaining seed at 6 p.m. May 12th is reserved for the national championship games at noon for the women and 4 p.m. for the men. Tickets are $20 each day at HartfordEvents.com or at the gate if available. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beer and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. Two dollars of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. What company makes your home more energy efficient, purifies your air, kills all viruses, and qualifies you for $6,000 in rebates? A.J. Michaels Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis at ajmichaels.com. Oh, honey, we better stop for gas soon. Let's pull into that Royal Farms. Ugh, gas is so expensive. Nope, it'll be cheaper than you think. Why's that? I signed up for Rofo Pay on the Royal Farms app. Now we save 15 cents per gallon at all Royal Farms. Wow, that'll save us a ton of money. I love you more every day. Well, then don't get a speeding ticket this trip, okay? Sign up for Rofo Rewards and upgrade to Rofo Pay and save 15 cents a gallon on gas for a limited time. Real fresh, real fast. Royal Farms.
The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, AJMichaels.com. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. All right, back in here on GCR as we are winding down for a Thursday edition of the program. Thanks again to Bo Braid for taking the time for us. Don't forget it's a Thursday, and that means it's a perfect day to be at the Green Turtle because on Thursdays at the Green Turtle, Griffin, you get free $10 bets at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks in Towson and Canton, and you can use that on whatever you would like, and you can experience the destination, the ultimate destination for game day excitement, great food, and live in-person betting. So be sure to check out the uh, Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks in Towson and Canton. Pick up your free bets, and uh, or maybe you know put some bets on uh, for Saturday. It might be a good place to watch the fights as well on Saturday night. So be sure to check out the Green Turtle today. Uh, and, and every day, really. But today you get free $10 bets in Canton and Towson. All right. Very good. Uh, anything that we needed to touch on today that we haven't? Ravens got a new... Uh, oh, yeah. We didn't talk about Deontay yes. Hardy. Thank you. You're right. Deontay Hardy, Baltimore native. Uh, Archbishop Curley alum is coming to Baltimore. Interesting that I think the opinion of some has been that the new in the new kickoff, you might need someone a little bit sturdier recurring returning kicks. I, there's still so much for us to figure out, right? Like um Dante uh, Deontay Hardy, the former Deontay you you may be confused. Deontay Hardy used to be known as Deontay Harris. And Deontay Harris in his rookie season was a revelation who made the pro bowl and was a first team all pro as a returner. I I don't know what this looks like moving forward in the return game because I've never I have not seen it. The Ravens clearly know more than I do about what you're going to look for in a kick returner. To me, Deontay Hardy is the prototypical kick returner, right? But they obviously think he has something to offer even with the new kickoff return. He's never been much of a receiver. He had one season in New Orleans where he was helpful as a wide receiver. Um, 570 yards and three touchdowns, 36 catches. And that's the high water mark by far. Like that stands out significantly. Otherwise, he's a complete non-factor as a wide receiver. He is a returner only. So it will be interesting to say the least, to see what this looks like. I mean, it's going to be interesting no matter who's returning kicks because it's just a new world that we're entering into with this kick return. But this is not this is not a move you're making for somebody that's going to help you in both departments. This is a return specialist only. Maybe you run a couple of gimmick plays for him during the season, but and I'm not saying he could never take the field like in an emergency, but... There is no track record of Deontay Hardy being a helpful NFL wide receiver. He is a return man. Track record is being a good return man. Neat story because he's a Baltimore kid that gets to come back and then put on the purple. Like, you like all of that. But this is a returner. Like, when he's listed as a receiver returner, it, flip that around. He's a returner and a, a you know, in a very minor way, a, a a receiver. And yes, with Devin Duvernay's departure, somebody had to do it. I think we were all assuming that that was going to default to Tylon Wallace uh, or Tylon Wallace. But, you know, I, I, I love Hardy's speed. It's there. I just don't know yet how that translates to the new kickoff. That's the part we got to learn about. Did he, did he return punts at all? 
I don't I don't even know if he was a punt returner. Admittedly, I was not paying a tremendous amount of attention to that department a year ago. Uh, um, he over his career he has last year specifically. No, last year he was. Last year okay. he was Buffalo's primary punt returner. Okay. Yeah, last year, in fact, 26 punt returns, and he had a touchdown in there as well. In fact, he was way more – he apparently didn't return kicks at all last year for Buffalo. He was only a punt returner. Well, that's interesting. I, I wonder if that's the role the Ravens view him in now, is that he's the primary punt returner and not the kickoff returner, especially not knowing what the kickoff return looked like. That, that's been flipped. He he was both in New Orleans until his final season in New Orleans. He really didn't return. Well, I guess he just didn't really play much at all. That's interesting. He must have been hurt in 2022, and I didn't realize that. Um, so he has been a a punt returner and a kick returner for the entirety of his career. Not just a kick returner. He's been a punt returner. In fact, his two touchdowns have come on punt returns. So okay. I think you pencil him in as the punt returner next year, and then – We'll see what the kickoff thing looks like once we get a better feel for that rule. Uh, but yeah, neat, neat that a Baltimore kid is uh, back in Baltimore. Love that. That's a that's a special story. Anything else? Is that it? I think right. that was it. Should we check in? Uh, who's leading the Masters? I guess. Ah, right. To see. I, I mean, they. I think they just started not that long ago, so Start I don't know how much it matters. Right? Something like that. Uh, Again, you're not Van allowed Royan, to win. Van Royen is through seven. Oh. He is uh, two under. Two under and who by had, who had Danny Willett? Danny Willett is two under as well. Bryson Uh-oh. DeChambeau and Danny Willett and Van Royen are all are the leaders at two under. Bryson DeChambeau, Danny Willett, and Eric Van Royen. Van Royen is that a, is that a Royen? Van Royen. Griffin, do you think there's a chance? I know. <laughs> do you think there's Let me any? Call Drew and we'll think there's any chance in hell that out. I know how to pronounce these cats' names? All right, let me pull this up. Still like, um, Oosthuizen, Oosthuizen. But uh, Kyle used to call him Ricky's Oyster House, and I don't know why that started, but I loved it, so I stuck with it. I, you know, there were thi- Riley's Oyster House. And then no, because they haven't they haven't spent a penny with us. Oh, so okay. all right, then know. never mind. If they want to spend, then by all well, means. I like the way uh, what's 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 his face Ustahuzin. That's what uh, that's what our our guy up in New York called him. Who? Oh, um, yeah, uh, uh, Mike Francesa. Yes. Eric Ooze. Eric Van Ruin Royen, whatever it is. Van Jason Ruin. Heyman has Eric Van mm, whatever. You're in good shape, friend. Uh, Danny Willett, as you said, was the other one. Yeah. Danny Willett, uh, of course, Casey's brother. Ooh, PFF Sean oh, has Danny all right. he's in good. He's in good shape. How about that? And then the other one. <laughs> Doesn't said even was, need Rory. Was Bryson. Yes. Uh, Ryan Frazier, mm. uh, our friend on Would You Rather Wednesdays, who always likes admonishing everyone for not. Boy, yesterday was a big one, too. People coming out of the woodwork on the first Would You Rather Wednesday question to say, how about both? Uh, either. Why are we choosing? My God. Yes, like 90% of the field hasn't started yet. And so Ryan, right. Ryan Frazier was all over him. So, yeah, he's got Bryson. When does Tiger start? I, I wanted to say it was right before they went on TV, like maybe in the 2 o'clock hour he was going to tee off. Uh, playing with uh, Max Homa, if I remember correctly today. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I again. I only care. I didn't actually. In fact, I shouldn't care because I wasn't able to get a golfer because we had too many people get in. Oh well, then yeah. Why, why Both Drew and I had to give up our golfers. Three fifty four. Jeez. Well, they wanted it on TV. Yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. they wanted it on TV. Uh, yeah, Drew and I both had to give up our golfers in order to uh, give spots to everybody. Well, thank else. you. I guess. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna win, everybody. Oh, you were about to lose yours. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, Kelly Sanford, who was the runner-up in our basketball contest, she, need it. she wanted to. Get, well, she didn't get anything from that. Neither um, did I. You weren't the runner-up. Um, she got in late, and I was like, ah. and I literally was about to text you and say, "Dude, sorry, you're out. <laughs> sorry, we have to cancel." Yeah, I guess I'm sorry. Been like, all right, fine. I'll find enough. I'll find 15 or 20 other people. Yeah, <laughs> so you're gonna start your own. Yeah, well, I'm good with that. Do your own. I would like you to to get more involved with this. You're young. You're around yeah, people yeah. that like these types of things. Would like for this to, to be run that way. All right, let's get a tidbit. Tidbit is brought to you today by your local Toyota dealer and buyatoyota.com. Proud sponsors of County Sports Zone. County Sports dot Zone is the website for you to find all the latest in high school sports uh, news, scores, schedules, rankings. Play pick 'em for boys and girls lacrosse, baseball, and softball at County Sports dot Zone. Proudly sponsored by your local Toyota dealer and buyatoyota.com. Um, all right, we will start with, uh, so yesterday was National Siblings Day, huh. so naturally, 
Happy Siblings Day to my sister. Bo and uh, yeah, shout out my brother and sister. Uh, but <laughs> very Josh, Josh yeah, 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 whatever. They're there too. Josh and Bo Naylor, of course, oh, homered the on the, on the uh, yeah. in the same inning. Nonetheless, well, how about that? They are uh, all right. So they are the thirteenth pair of brothers to homer in the same game. They did it in the same inning, but in the same game all time, they're the thirteenth pair of brothers. I, I would like it to be said as a brother. I would have appreciated you maybe wishing me a happy Siblings Day. I am a brother. Oh yeah. You're okay. Happy yeah. siblings day. I'm someone's brother. Happy brother. Yeah. Happy brother. Happy day. brother. Okay, that'll work. Yeah. Um, any uh, would you like me to reciprocate? Yeah. I, I guess happy I would. siblings day. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate it. You're that. someone's brother. Yes. 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 I'm a two people's brother. Oh yeah. Oh, you think yeah. you're better? Uh, you think you're more of a sibling maybe, than maybe, I am? Maybe just a little. Maybe yeah. just a little. I've got a brother-in-law. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> any idea who, what pair of teammate brothers to homer in the same game? have done it the most. So this is the second time that Bo and Josh have done it. Teenage there brothers. are five pairs that have actually homered in more games. Three plus five. Games. Well, I mean, I'll say Cal and Bill. They only did it twice. So they yeah, would be tied I mean, Bill, with the Bill was not much of a home run yeah. here. So I'm not <laughs> terribly twice, though, surprised by that. Um, I'm trying to think of the Boone brothers. Were However, the... both times that they did it twice, uh, it was in the same inning. Well, that's interesting. That Billy, that Billy and Cal did it. That's really interesting. In 1990 and 1996. How about that? Um, Sandy and Roberto Alomar. No. They were only teammates briefly. In, um, I don't think they ever did it once. According Cleve- to Sarah Lyons, they've not, and who is uh, citing Elias Sports, they've not done that. Okay. I mean, that's yeah, they were only they're teammates they're for a little while, so it's not terribly surprising. Um, how about... Let's see if you can get... Uh, how about I mean I'll try I'll try Aaron and Brett Boone. Mm, no, the they Boone's were, again, not on the these list. guys were only teammates for a little while. Like they were teammates briefly in Cincinnati. Uh, uh, how about uh, the brothers Canseco? The how brothers about Canseco, Jose and Ozzy are not on the list. How about Jeremy and Jason Giambi? Jeremy and Jason Giambi, four times second most all time by a, a pair of brothers to homer in the same game. Jeremy and Jason. How about? I just got to think of other brothers. Were J.D. and Stephen Drew teammates? Uh, They were not. At least they didn't homer in the same game together. Were, were Justin and B.J. Upton teammates? They were, and they homered together in six games. Okay. That is the most all-time by a pair of brothers. They also are the third pair, because there's, there's only three pairs that have homered in the same inning. The Ripkins, the Nailers, and the Uptons. And the okay. Uptons. What about... I know Brian and Marcus. Sorry, th- three pairs that do it twice. Were Brian and yeah. Marcus Giles teammates? They were not. At least they didn't homer as teammates. Man. So you got the Uptons, you got the Giambis, the Nailers. There's mm. three more sets that have done it three times. I'll give you, I don't know, I guess I'll give it to you, the, the Wainers. Uh, Paul Wainer? Paul and Lloyd Wainer. Three it. times okay. homer in the same game. It's a good old-timey baseball name, Paul Wainer. I believe he's in the Hall of Fame. Um, that w- that was it. There's two more. Two more. I'm trying to figure Jesus. out hints that I can give. There, yeah. The, well, one half is of each is in the Hall of Fame. One half of each is in the Hall of Fame. Actually, wait. Hold on. Let me make sure. One half of each is in the Hall of Fame. Damn. And one half of one of them, uh, a former Orioles legend. Yeah, they're both in the Hall of Fame. Both uh, both brother, both halves of the pairs. Uh, Tony and Chris Gwynn? No, not the Gwyns. Yikes. Hall of Famer, whose brother also played. Aye, aye, aye. Um, yeah, because you're not really going to remember their brother. That's the that, problem, yeah. right? Like, the problem is you got to come up with it based on who the Hall of Famer is and just that had a brother is what you're working with. Yeah. Uh, in the big leagues. Man. Uh, Hank Aaron's brother. Hank Aaron's okay. brother. It was yes. Tommy, Tommy right? Aaron. Tommy Aaron. Um, they also did Homer in the same inning just once. Um, it was, uh, oh, it was while well, well, they were with the Milwaukee Braves. And the other one was an Oriole. And you, yes, for but one the way season. Th- yeah. Re- did Reggie Jackson have a brother? No. Well, I mean, maybe. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, one season Oriole in the Hall of Fame. I don't know of Jim Tomey having a brother. No, not Jim Tomey. I don't know of 
Did Vladimir Guerrero have a brother? He did. Really? His brother's name oh, was... Oh, Wilton Guerrero. Wilton Guerrero. I utterly forgot about that. they homered in the same Guerrero. game four times. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, yeah in Montreal. Yeah, I do remember that. That ended up working out. Uh, uh, so Hol- Jackson Holiday also was uh, on on the list for being at 20 years and 128 days old. He is the fourth youngest, uh, sorry, not the fourth youngest. He would be the third youngest Oriole because they were including Brown's history. Oh, they are. Okay, no, right. They all were on Orioles history. So, yeah, fourth youngest Oriole to record an RBI in his MLB de- debut. Older than only, there's only one that you should get. At 18 years old in 1955. Who the n- – I mean, Brooks Robinson? Brooks Robinson. Yeah, I mean, that's – Major League debut at 18, uh, 18 years I mean, old in 122 50, days. I I d- it was 55 to 77. Yeah, yeah. I guess I should have. And then uh, the other two Orioles to – younger than Jackson Holiday to RBI in their debut were Andy Etchenbaron. Andy Etchenbaron. Etchenbaron and Ron Hansen. Oh, okay. Actually, those are two that I, I probably – Could have gotten. I, I didn't know how young they were when yeah. they – but, like, those are two at least prominent Orioles. Oh, and by the way, uh, Josh and Bo Naylor also became – it also became the third time that brothers have uh, – so Josh had the game-tying RBI in the ninth inning. Okay. Or sorry, no, it was the tenth inning. And then his brother – and then Bo had the game-winning RBI in the bo- in the bottom. So he had a walk-off in the right after. So that is the third time that brothers have done that in the ninth inning or later. It was BJ, How about that? BJ and Justin. BJ hit a tying home run, and then Justin hit a walk-off homer. In 2013, and then the Rifkins did it. Just out here celebrating Siblings Day better than you. And what'd you do for your siblings, huh? It was unfortunate because Gavin Sheets did the best he could. He got five RBI yesterday and uh, was not enough. That's tough. That's tough. He's the uh, only one. I think he's the only one hitting on the White Sox right now. Well, I mean, who else would? Well, I mean, they, it's funny you'd say that. And then you're like, oh, right, they still have Moncada. They still have Benintendi. They still have Andrew Moncada, Vaughn. Moncada, I mean, he had one, was uh, it one good season. Yeah, you're like, probably right about that. not been anything. Yeah. Like, because... Stan, like Stan's been high on him too. I think isn't Eloy Jimenez still there and Roberts still there? He is hurt. Is he okay. hurt? I think Eloy Jimenez just landed on the. I IL. just realized I could name more Chicago White Sox than I thought I yeah. could at the beginning of the season. I was yeah, like, Andrew wow. Vaughn has been disappointing. Well, so are the White Sox. That's Paul DeYoung is there. Oh yeah, Paul DeYoung is there. Nicky Lopez. Uh, I guess I remember Nicky Lopez. Yeah. All right, let's yeah. go. Let's go. Let's okay. get it. Let's get tubular. Why are we talking about the White Sox? Tubular is brought to you today by Atman's Harbor Point, the best place to hang out and watch games because it's everything you love about the original Atman's plus a bar. Corned beef piled high, the desserts, the soups, all the deli sandwiches, hand-rolled bagels in the morning. It's just everything about Atman's. It's Atman's Deli. Perhaps you've heard of them. And now it's Atman's Deli, and it's a sports bar, and it's in Harbor Point, and you should get there this weekend as you're headed down for games atmansdeli.com to find the daily specials. Grayson Rodriguez on the mound tonight as the Orioles look for the sweep going up against Garrett Whitlock. It is on Masson at 7 o'clock, also in the rest of the country. It is on MLB Network, and it's not they're not doing a local broadcast. They're doing a, an MLB Network national broadcast. Um, Tom Verducci is going to be involved with that. Uh, J.P. Morosi will be involved with that. It's tonight, 7 o'clock. Masson and MLB Network. You can watch the Masters starting at 3 on ESPN and then floating around on all these various apps, ESPN+, Plus, Paramount+, Plus, CBS Sports app, and the Masters app uh, leading up to that, so good luck. MLB Network, Mets Braves at noon, Athletics Rangers at 3.30, Pirates Phillies at 7 locally, uh, Monumental for Capital Sabres at 7, TNT and True TV for Knicks Celtics at 7.30, Pelicans Kings at 10, Access TV for Impact Wrestling at 8. Some non-sports highlights? Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, Ryan Gosling and Johnny Knoxville will be on Jimmy Fallon. Tonight. They doing a project together? Uh, that'd be cool. Well, if they uh, were. Uh, Gosling's promoting the Fall Guy, right? Yes, That's he's also hosting SNL on Saturday. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, Knoxville, I think Knoxville, they're bit, they've been teasing Jackass Five. So really? Oh, maybe I did see that they were doing that. Yeah. Um, so I they haven't confirmed anything, but yeah. Right. Um, and uh, oh, and then Fallout on Prime Video. Well, they brought in like series. that whole new crew. Like for they brought for Jackass Four, oh, oh, for they Jackass. were all like this young crew that like they meshed in with the original crew. Mm. Like I want to say one guy's name might have been Poops. <laughs> Swear it's a great name. And I was like, man, this this is kind of weird because like I realized I would have laughed at that when I was a kid, but like, and I'm still watching Jackass, so like, I should be willing to go along with it. But there's a part of me that's just sort of like, really, is that? Is that what we're doing? They got to do I the porta pot thing on him, right? Or they just throw I'm, the, they I'm just launch the porta pot. I'm trying to remember <laughs> if that was actually his name. 
Like Poopies. That was his name. Poopies. Poopies. And there were others that they like introduced to the crew. There was a gr- uh, girl named Rachel Wolfson that they like introduced that were part of it in the last Jackass film. But yeah, Poopies has stuck with me. As it should. Oh, poopies. Um, anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. Fall, Fallout on Prime Video. That is uh, the based on the video game. Right. Fallout. Um, it looks like it looks really well done. Um, I don't. I can't. I don't think I remember. I, I didn't. I didn't play the game, but like it looks really it's good. Two of us. So, so uh, yeah, that's out on Prime Video. All right. And then Baby Reindeer on Netflix. This is just a series. It's like a dr- like a little dra- dr- drama series about this. Uh, he's a British comedian, and he's got a female stalker. And uh, okay. And everyone's like saying, "Oh, you're enabling her." And he's like, no, I, I don't like it. I, I got nothing. I don't know why this. it's called. I was I trying to nothing. figure out why it was called Baby, Baby Reindeer, Reindeer. Yeah, and I, I could not I find got, anything. I got nothing. So. All right, very good. Fallout. Thanks today to um, Bo Braid. Thanks also to Joe Serpico. Thanks to Colin Burns, as well as to, oh, God, why am I blanking? Joe Serpico. Right. You no, said I said Joe Serpico. Serpico. Oh, Josh Holliday. Yeah, Josh Holliday. We'll get all that up in the greatest hits section of the. Oh, my God, it's so good. Tab at GlennClarkRadio.com. Stan the Fan is in tomorrow. Oh, uh, Ryan Spielborgs. Ryan will Spielborgs us. will join us. He's calling uh, the Apple. or the home debut of Jackson Holiday tomorrow night for Apple TV Plus. So we're you all can complain about that. We're teammate of Matt Holiday, right? Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, Very yeah, much so. Is that it? Oh, and uh, Jacoby Gillespie will uh, join us. Jacoby well. Gillespie, right? Yes. Who is uh, headed to play basketball at Maryland? Transfer in from Belmont. Our first opportunity to meet and catch up with him. Mm-hmm. Stuff and things. Stuff and things. Thanks everybody at Pressbox. All of our great sponsors and partners, including. Ruth's Chris, Live Casino and Hotel, Atman's Deli, A.J. Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms, Costas Inn, Hartford Community College, Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Thursday night. Go Birds. Duke sucks.